Welcome to the Global ITAM Summit. My name is Jeffrey Tiefertiller, and I'm pleased, I'm excited to bring this to you this year. This is our fourth annual summit, and this time we're doing it a little bigger, a little more special. We have many guests sharing their expertise with us, with you, and I know that you will find value in what is being presented. Please show them your love and your appreciation as well. I have shirts like this printed out for several. This asset management, maximizing investments on thingamajigs someone else purchased. We have that as kind of a motto in asset management, don't we? Somebody buys a software and it's our job to get the most out of it. It's somebody signs up for cloud and it's our job to now figure out how to maximize that investment. So I thought you might appreciate this t-shirt and some of the others. They get more humorous as we go along. I wanted to thank you for joining us. Also, Service Management Leadership is our sponsor. That's my little company. And uh, you'll see some promotions for that as we go along. But stay tuned. We have several hours of great programming with you. These will also replay on my YouTube channel as well as my podcast channel on Thursdays coming up. So thank you for joining us. I know you'll enjoy it and stay tuned for many, many great guests. Up first, we have Craig Garenti. Craig is an Oracle expert. He and his company, Palisade Compliance, help organizations with their Oracle needs, whether it's renewals, audits, all of the Oracle world. Craig himself came from Oracle and is a deep expert in the ecosystem as well as the licensing. I thought of Craig with this t-shirt, software asset management, controlling uncontrollable, intangible investments. That's what it feels like, especially with Oracle. So I appreciate Craig for sharing his expertise. Give him feedback. Let him know what you think about this, especially if it's awesome, right? Thank you, Craig, once again. And here's Craig. Hi, everyone. My name is Craig Garenti, and I'm the president and founder of Palisade Compliance. And I am so excited to be joining you today for the 2024 Global ITAM Summit. So I want to thank uh, Jeffrey T. Fertiller for inviting me again uh, to talk about issues around licensing and compliance. And um, when I was talking with Jeffrey, uh, we were trying to decide on what's a good topic? What do people want to hear about? And he's like, Craig, give me something different. Give me something new. Uh, give me something uh, that's, you know, uh, m maybe uh, a little off center. So um, I decided, or we decided, that uh, today's conversation will be about um, compliance being something that is negotiable, compliance being something that is more uh, or as much opinion as it is fact. And I know a lot of us uh, in the ITAM world, uh, we look at that and sort of turn our head a little bit and say, you know, how could that be? Uh, you're either in compliance or you're out of compliance. Uh, but the reality is uh, much more complex. And I know uh, there's a lot of firms out there who've spent a lot of money on different systems and tools uh, to give them what they consider a compliance position. And, and I love those tools, and I think they do a really good job in bringing you facts that you can incorporate into your decision making so that you can form an opinion. Uh, and when I think about, uh, you know, getting an audit report from a vendor, be it Oracle or another vendor, really all that is is their opinion based on uh, the facts that they have and the decisions that they've made to lead them to create that report for you. Uh, so it's just an opinion piece. Uh, very similar uh, when Palisade Compliance does an audit report for our clients, be it a proactive audit or something in response to, let's say, something Oracle has produced, we are giving you our opinion based on the facts that have been gathered, either through tools or systems or interviews or spreadsheets or scripts or what have you. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just an opinion. <clears throat> so uh, an opinion based on lots of experience and, and lots of facts, hopefully. 
Um, so that's uh, today's conversation. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background before I dig into that, uh, talk a little bit about Palisade Compliance and myself. Uh, so I spent uh, 16 years at Oracle. I was their global vice president of contracts, business practices, uh, the audit team, the LMS audit team, uh, had about 1,200 people working for me all around the world. Uh, so anything you bought from Oracle, and for a while, any audit that Oracle undertook uh, went through a tool, a process, a system uh, <clears throat> that I was managing. Uh, fast forward uh, from 1995 to 2011, and I started Palisade Compliance, right there. And uh, Palisade is an independent a consulting firm that helps organizations with their Oracle licensing uh, and contracting. So we do negotiations, audit supports, ULA certifications. Uh, we've developed our own tools and scripts uh, to help us analyze customers' contracts as well as their usage of Oracle products. And we pull all that information together to build our compliance reports for our customers. Um, <clears throat> so enough about Palisade and enough about me, and I thought I'd get into uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, our conversation today. So let's talk about compliance being negotiable. And there's really four elements uh, that you need to negotiate to ensure uh, that uh, you are in compliance. And uh, I say need to negotiate, I guess I should have said you should be negotiating these things uh, as you build your compliance position. So the first thing are your contracts with your vendors. Now, Palisade, we just focus on customers' Oracle contracts, and that could mean PeopleSoft, Hyperion, Siebel, Cerner, SunJava, whatever. Um, we, we help with all of those. But at the end of the day, uh, when you are uh, licensing software, hardware, services from a vendor, it's really important to look at your agreements um, through multiple lenses. Obviously, we always look at them from the fiscal lens. Am I paying a fair price for the stuff that I'm getting? Am I getting an industry-leading discount? Things like that. But I highly encourage you also uh, to negotiate those things from a compliance position. And not just from a compliance position today, but you have to think about, when I sign this thing, am I going to be audited in two or three years by the vendor to ensure compliance? So will this document hold up over time? Will it keep me in compliance two years out, three years out, four years out? Or, there are, or are there traps in here that I know, based on my business, will come up and haunt me later? So it's really important, I believe, that uh, from an IT asset management standpoint, uh, you have a seat at the table. You're talking with, you're not leading the conversations, you're not the driver of the negotiations with your vendors, but you're definitely a stakeholder and an influencer in that process. Uh, and you're going to be the unsung hero because if you're able to influence that process and you're able to get certain terms and conditions into your agreements uh, with those vendors, you will save uh, your organization millions and millions of dollars later on. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. So the reality of compliance with licensing is that more than half of the compliance issues uh, that we see with our clients are not based on how much stuff are you using. Uh, you licensed 100 database license and Oracle says you're using 200 so therefore you owe us uh, you know, a couple of million dollars. That is half or less than half of the things we see. Uh, what is the other half? What are the other half of items? Well, they come from contracts, you know, items in your agreements uh, with the vendor that have uh, maybe changed within your business and pushed you out of compliance. <clears throat> so let me give you a, a few examples. Uh, one is uh, who can use the software? The customer definition, we call it in the Oracle world. So if, if Palisade was uh, licensing software from Oracle, it might say, you know, Palisade compliance, uh, no subsidiaries, uh, no other entities can use the software. And that might be a very standard clause of a, uh, of a software vendor or a cloud vendor or a hardware vendor even. Uh, so it's really important that you expand that definition as much as possible to include not only who can use the software uh, today, but who might be using it tomorrow? So what if Palisade in a year did an acquisition? 
or what if a, a company acquired Palisade? All of those things will determine, uh, you know, your compliance position, you know, your M&A activity, plus what's in your agreement. So you really want to be uh, careful uh, and ensure that you have proper language. I'll give you an example. We had a client, a huge technology company, and they were negotiating an agreement uh, with Oracle end of May. And I went up uh, to uh, our sponsor and I said, uh, I'll call him Bob. Bob, uh, there's one thing here that you told me is that your company is uh, very acquisitive and you're going to go into this, um, this pattern of buying other companies. So the way this ULA is written today is going to cause you a big problem three years down the road when you're trying to certify out of it. You're going to find yourself out of compliance at that point, and you're going to be forced to do the next deal with Oracle. So what I would like you to do is uh, let's get this uh, language inserted into the agreement. We gave them the language, and uh, there was a lot of pushback uh, on the Oracle side. I said, let's give them money. Let's give Oracle some money and uh, tell the salesperson, if they put this language in the contract, you'll pay more than you're paying right now. And uh, that's a tough sell to go through a procurement organization and tell them to spend more because, uh, you know, their KPIs are all about uh, savings. And guess what? They didn't listen to me. So three years down the road, uh, they were trying to get out of this agreement with Oracle, and sure enough, M&A activity had blocked them. And I remember Bob saying to me, I wish we had taken the advice of Palisade three years ago. So sure enough, fast forward, uh, the next ULA with Oracle had all the language. Um, customer paid a little bit more uh, to get those terms and conditions in there, but it kept them into compliance uh, so that three years later, they were actually able to certify out of that agreement. So uh, customer definition, who can use it, where can you use it, what can you do with the software, those are all the types of things that uh, you want to negotiate up front because once you have those events, a vendor like Oracle, Microsoft, whomever, they're not just going to throw in those terms and conditions for free. Uh, they're going to see it as an opportunity uh, to increase their revenue, and they're going to want to extract that from you. Uh, so negotiating your contracts way up front will give you a better chance of being in compliance towards the end. The next thing you want to negotiate uh, to make sure you're in compliance are policies. And uh, policies are a two-way street. You have policies, and your vendors have policies. Uh, your vendors have policies that are written on the internet, on their websites, and uh, they've got policies, we call them unwritten. They're written down somewhere, but you just can't see them. And um, whether or not those things matter is really important to your compliance position. Uh, let me give you a great example, again, focusing on the Oracle world. Uh, Oracle contracts are typically silent on licensing uh, differences when you're running their software in a bare metal server or on a hypervisor on a virtualized environment like VMware. Contracts uh, don't make a distinction between them. However, Oracle has created a lot of confusion in this area. Well, they put up policy documents that talk about you know, not only how to license Oracle in a virtualized environment, but even how to license Oracle in the cloud. And sometimes these policies are uh, to your benefit, and sometimes they are to your detriment. Um, and Oracle even has other policies that they keep sort of behind the firewall there uh, that are uh, known to them, but not known to you. So for example, how do I segment my environment so I can use uh, uh, need less licenses if I'm using VMware? Uh, there's very specific instructions that Oracle will accept uh, if you are under the um, idea that you have to accept their policies. Uh, now, the thing with uh, software licensing and uh, hardware and, and services is there's typically language in your contracts that say what's included in that arrangement and what's not included in that arrangement. And things like uh, things that are not in the agreements are typically excluded. Uh, Oracle even goes so far as when they put these policy documents. They even say these are not part of your contracts and they can't be included. Uh, yada, 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 but then they go do it anyway. So, and they try to enforce them and they can change them at any time. So it's really important 
when you are thinking about compliance is how do we negotiate in or out any policies? Uh, again, with Oracle, contracts are pretty silent. They don't reference these policies. They don't talk about these policies. So you have an opportunity either um, at the point you're negotiating your agreement to include them or exclude them, or uh, if you were ever to get an audit letter from Oracle, the first thing, one of the first things you would do is figure out, well, which of these non-contractual policies is Oracle going to try to use against me? And before we send anything to Oracle, uh, we want to talk to them about uh, what's included, what's not included, uh, because again, that's a negotiation, right? It's not in the agreement, so exactly how these things are interpreted and used um, will be critical to determine if you're in compliance or not, right? If you're negotiating out the policies around licensing in a virtualized environment, because they were never in there anyway, then you have a lot less to worry about from a huge finding from the Oracle LMS audit team uh, at the end. Uh, but you have to do that earlier in the process to be much more effective. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, but the last thing you want to do is get into a position where you give a vendor like Oracle all this information and then they put it in a black box somewhere offshore and they give you an answer and you don't like that answer and now you're trying to prove that answer wrong. Um, it'd be like you know giving everything to the IRS and saying, we don't know what the rules are, we don't know what the policies are, but why don't you tell us how much money we owe you? Uh, and then we'll start negotiating from there. Like no one would ever, ever do that. So negotiating those policies are really important. And I mentioned a few, licensing in the cloud, um, licensing uh, in a virtualized environment. Those are very specific to Oracle, but all vendors do this where they have policies. Uh, and they're very effective at uh, determining, at, at uh, having clients believe they are part of the agreement. And, and they're so effective because often the sales reps believe it too. Oh, that's our policy, so you have to follow that. It's our software. Uh, and that's not really the case. Uh, we always, uh, at Palisade, talk about following the contracts. Uh, so if your contract references a policy, like Oracle's references uh, technical support policies, yeah, then we have to uh, pay attention to those a lot closer than we do uh, something that's non-contractual. Because Oracle could put anything out there, right? They could put something out there tomorrow that says you're not allowed to use anything in the cloud doesn't mean that completely changes your agreements. In fact, uh, Oracle has changed policies around cloud licensing, where at one point they didn't have any. Uh, then they made it very advantageous, because they wanted to be a database company, uh, to use their software uh, in any cloud. And then they sort of uh, took that policy from a shield for customers and turned it into a weapon to use against them to say, hey, you need uh, potentially twice as many licenses uh, if you're running over here, or you can't run it over there because it's not authorized. So understanding those policies uh, and negotiating them in or out, whether it's in the agreements with Oracle or uh, in an audit is, is really important. The other thing is you have policies. So use them, right? We have a policy that we will not share our confidential hardware software configurations outside of our organization. It's our policy. Uh, so you want to use those policies. Understand what your own policies are so that if Oracle is going to argue policy, you know, you've got your own uh, to back up because uh, it's your data, it's your security, uh, not Oracle's that is at issue when you start transferring information uh, overseas uh, to somebody else. So you want to be really, really careful. So uh, negotiating policies in or out. Um, now, I have said negotiate them, but also another effective way is to not negotiate them. Just to live in the vagueness of your agreements with Oracle. And I, oh, that's really uncomfortable, especially for audit auditors and accountants and uh, people who like to see things black or white, yes or no, uh, as you can probably tell from this presentation, uh, I'm not one of those people. I love living in the gray area. I love when there's uh, different ways to look at things because that puts me in control and I can look through something uh, and make an argument through a lens that puts me in the best possible light versus uh, trying to uh, make sure I fit into this uh, pigeonhole. So uh, it's definitely something uh, to, to understand uh, that is negotiable, uh, or, or maybe you want to stay silent on it, right? We can't negotiate every single policy that a vendor might have uh, in an agreement. We'd never get these things signed, uh, but you want to really know uh, what are the important ones. 
and how will that impact. So understanding what Oracle's policy is today, uh, regardless of whether it's in the contract, you know, if you can live with it, great. Uh, if you can't, that's great too. Uh, you just need to have your argument straight when Oracle comes knocking on the door. And let's talk about that. The third thing uh, to negotiate, the audit process, right? So you've got a vendor, uh, Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, SAP, they come knocking on the door saying, congratulations, you have been chosen for an audit. Uh, and you need to send us all this information and set up a meeting in three days. Uh, so the first thing you want to do there is negotiate that process. So the process, uh, again, focusing on Oracle agreements for a second, uh, there is no process defined other than uh, it has to start in a certain number of days and you'll provide a reasonable access uh, to information. Uh, so that Oracle can uh, can do its thing and audit the heck out of you. So, um, you know, what does all that mean? Well, it's really important uh, when we think about the cadence of an audit. I, I want to talk to you about how vendors do audits and how you should flip the script and negotiate something very different. Uh, when a vendor is auditing you, they make it very easy at the beginning of the audit. They send you this letter. It's non-confrontational. They set up a meeting. They maybe give you some spreadsheets. They ask for some data. Uh, you send all this information, uh, and it, it's a nice, smooth process. And then at the end, bam, you get hit with a huge finding. Now, remember, if you are chosen for an audit, most likely that vendor thinks you're out of compliance. So they are looking for you to give them information so they can have uh, some data to support their opinion. Remember, we talked about opinion versus facts. Their opinion that they've precast that you're already out of compliance. So they are looking for data to support that opinion. Um, so they make it very easy until the end. And then they give you this huge finding. And then it becomes difficult. Then it becomes confrontational. Then the sales teams come in and they threaten the legal teams. Um, and then it becomes, you know, how do we negotiate down from this really high number? You know, our, our uh, recommendations, my recommendations, what I've seen work really well, is if you negotiate that whole process up front. So the audit becomes very difficult in the beginning because a vendor isn't used to someone standing up for themselves and saying, no, I'm not sending you all this information. That is unreasonable. Um, how I use virtualization has nothing to do with your software. Now, if you can um, point me to the contract where it says it does, I'll be happy to comply. That's just one example. I know we're talking a lot about virtualization, but that is the Oracle world that we still live in. So you want to negotiate the process uh, up front, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be challenging, but the process and how an audit is conducted will often determine whether or not you're in compliance. Now, let me give you an example. Again, what information is shared with the vendor? Well, what's relevant? You know, the vendors want to gather as much information as possible and find things to uh, lead you to believe that you're out of compliance. So if we can limit the scope of the things that they're allowed to see, legitimately allowed to see and not see, uh, that's great. That's a big win for you. Uh, not that we're trying to hide anything from the vendor, but it's just simply none of their business. Uh, and we know that they're going to take uh, non-contractual items like policies and try to use them against you. So why give a vendor uh, who doesn't need to know that information, doesn't have a right to it, why just send it to them? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so negotiating that. Uh, negotiating how the data will be processed. You know, is it going to be processed uh, in your location? Uh, again, let's talk about policies. You have a policy, I'm sure, that says data cannot be shared outside of your company. Um, and, uh, you know, if a vendor wants to come in, physically come in and audit you and sit there with a notebook, let them ha have at it. That's just another example. And we've done that. We've had uh, Oracle, you know, have to go to customer sites and conduct things on site. Um, it, it prevents them from taking that data again, shipping it offshore, putting it into a black box, giving them as much time as they want to find something that they might be able to hang their hat on. Um, so again, negotiating that, hey, yeah, come on site, bring your notebooks, you've got a couple of days, answer your questions, parse through the data, and, uh, and, and, and be done with it. So that's a, a sort of an extreme example of, of how to negotiate the process. Uh, another uh, example 
is rather than sending all this information to a vendor so that they could determine whether or not uh, you're in compliance, you could have an alternative process where you send them your results of your own internal audit that shows that you're in compliance. And again, you have to actually be in compliance, uh, have a legitimate claim to compliancy uh, to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, that's another way. So rather than the vendor getting all this information and then trying to find something, you're sending them information that you've already gathered and say, no, Oracle, no Microsoft, we are in compliance and here's the proof that we're in compliance. Uh, and you can ask us anything you want about this. We're happy to uh, answer your questions on our methodology and our process, uh, but this is why we're in compliance. And ultimately the goal is uh, rather than uh, negotiating from a really high number uh, and trying to come down, right? So rather than getting a $100 million compliance finding from Oracle, and signing a $10 million deal and saying, oh, look, we did great, we got it down by 90%. Uh, how about we start at zero? Right? How about we start from a position where you're in compliance uh, rather than trying to prove something uh, to a vendor who already has this notion that you're out of compliance? Uh, so negotiating the audit process is definitely something that will have a huge impact on whether or not you're found to be in compliance or out of compliance in an audit. Item number four that you can negotiate is actually the final audit report. And this is true uh, not just of Oracle, but uh, of all vendors. So remember at the very beginning of this conversation um, where we talked about a, um, opinions versus facts, you know, are you factually out of compliance or is it someone's opinion that you're out of compliance? So when you get that audit report, let's say again from Oracle, that is whoever drafted that audit report, that is their opinion based on information and suppositions and uh, insinuations and policy documents and all this other stuff that they have in their heads, it's their opinion as to sort of the best case scenario for Oracle. Honestly, that's most of the time, that's exactly what it is. But, uh, but you have a different opinion. So even if you did not negotiate the contracts, and you did not negotiate the policies, and you did not negotiate the audit process, and you sort of went through everything, just doing everything the vendor said, and now you've got the final report from Oracle, well, then you could start negotiating from there. Well, you owe us $100 million because of this virtualization thing. I don't see that in my contract. Uh, you owe us this money because we think you're using the software to do that. Mm, that's not what we're doing with the software. Uh, even uh, looking at those audit reports and uh, arguing the facts, not just opinions. We think you're using software uh, on these four computers. And then you can go back and do your own audit and say, well, actually we did an audit and we don't see the software is run uh, in a way that requires a license on those four computers. And all these things uh, we've successfully negotiated, uh, helped our clients negotiate uh, with vendors, uh, with, with Oracle. Uh, for example. So even at the very end, if, if we didn't negotiate that, I just really want to emphasize that the audit report you're getting from the vendor is an opinion piece uh, based on a point of view that they already had uh, before they started auditing you. They were just looking for, uh, in general, they're just looking for information that will put you in a, a less enviable position where you're trying to uh, negotiate uh, down from a high number. Remember, Oracle's audits and many vendors' audits, uh, they are not designed to find the ultimate truth. They are designed uh, to uh, provide leverage for the vendor to increase their revenue. That's one thing they're designed to do. Uh, and they're also designed to protect the vendor's IP. So depending on your point of view, which one is first and which one is second, uh, I tend to uh, see evidence that sales reps are more interested in uh, generating revenue than protecting IP, but uh, there are uh, different reps out there with, with different motivations. So really important uh, to even negotiate uh, both the facts and the opinions that are included in the final report from Oracle. And that's all I've got today. So four things uh, to remember in terms of negotiating your compliance position. Uh, with any vendor, these are not limited to Oracle, is uh, negotiate the heck out of your contracts. Uh, think about those policies um, and think about uh, you know, what you want in your agreements and, and what you want to stay silent on. 
Uh, if you ever get an audit letter from a vendor, negotiate the process on how that audit will be conducted and always take a proactive approach where you're giving uh, the final answer to the vendor rather than the data behind it, if you can. Uh, and then finally, uh, whether or not you've negotiated those first three, when you get that final opinion, excuse me, when you get that final opinion piece from Oracle or any vendor, uh, continue your negotiations. And, and if I had to add one more, if a fifth one, if you have to buy something uh, from that vendor based on an audit, uh, it brings you right back to number one, which is negotiate that agreement, negotiate the settlement agreement, negotiate the contract that comes out of that uh, if there is a compliance finding. Uh, so remember, uh, uh, compliance is as much an opinion as it is a fact. Uh, and if you negotiate all of those things throughout, you will be uh, much more likely uh, to be found in compliance by yourselves and your vendors. I hope this was helpful. Uh, again, my name is Craig Renty uh, from Palisade Compliance. And Jeffrey, I really, really, really want to thank you uh, for letting me uh, participate in the 2024 Global ITEM Summit. Uh, I've seen the other speakers. Uh, they're going to be amazing. Um, I've participated before, and it's been fantastic. So I encourage everyone uh, who made it through my presentation uh, to make sure you go uh, watch the others, uh, because it really is valuable information that could help you uh, survive and thrive as you are battling uh, IP uh, issues with uh, vendors who uh, might have different opinions than you. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Craig, for sharing your expertise with us. I, for one, learned a lot and still learn from you, along with learning from the other guests. You have a deep knowledge in Oracle and are willing to share it, which I appreciate. Now, a word from our sponsor, Service Management Leadership, as we continue our series of great guests coming up very soon. Is your asset management program or CMDB sick? If your asset management program or CMDB is not healthy and you want to get either of them checked out, service management leadership will diagnose the issues. We will provide you with a free initial consultation and assessment. The short assessment includes a review of your metrics and tools. This includes what you are measuring and why, plus your tools and integration. A meeting with stakeholders to understand their needs. Most issues originate from unstated or unmet stakeholder expectations. We will ask the right questions. We will then summarize our findings at a high level and give you a proposal that discusses next steps. What makes service management leadership different than most consultancies you encounter is a holistic approach that comes from being in the industry for a few decades. Yes, decades. Our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller, began in the asset management industry in May of 1994. Our approach includes an end-to-end -end understanding of your processes. The holistic approach also includes an understanding of your current state tools and what you want to accomplish. The most important aspect of our holistic approach is the alignment of activities to the needs of stakeholders. Every action or effort that is not aligned to what your stakeholders need is wasted. Our approach also includes a review of your in-house expertise. Lastly, our approach includes an understanding of your current metrics and reporting and what is needed. If you are not getting the value needed from your asset management program or your CMDB, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller and our team of experts at Service Management Leadership.
Next up, Pamela Fulmer. Pam is with Tactical Law. Pam is a rare breed in this software asset management world, and it's awesome, as she brings a legal expertise to the software audits, software renewals, software asset management as a whole. I thought of her with this t-shirt, software audits, a ploy by software publishers to increase sales. I know that Pam will get a kick out of this as that is so true. Please voice your appreciation for her and she has a lot of valuable things to say. And we thank you once again for Hello, my name is Pam Fulmer and I'm an attorney with Tactical Law Group. And we are a boutique law firm in San Francisco that focuses on um, a lot on licensing disputes. A lot of our cases involve Oracle or Quest or other publishers that are known for aggressive software audits. And today um, we are going to discuss software audits and um, uh, kind of talk to you generally about how to prepare for an audit. Um, what to do when you get the audit, what could trigger an audit, um, and some strategies for, for fighting back on, on predatory software audits. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if people have um, experienced an audit. Uh, it is um, often my clients seem a little shell-shocked um, having gone through an audit. Um, and if I get retained basically, you know, after the audit report has issued, then I basically spend my first meeting with the client trying to, almost like a therapist, trying to calm them down because it's been such a brutal experience for them. So um, software audits are definitely something that you want to prepare for before you get hit with the audit notice, because once the audit notice drops, it's really too late to do that preparation. And so you ask, um, well, what can I do? Well, the first thing that you need to do is try to understand your contractual rights. And a big part of that is to collect um, your license, the actual licenses, the ordering documents, um, you know, uh, maintenance and support agreements, all of the contracts that exist with that software publisher um, so that you have them on hand and can basically uh, be prepared. Um, I can't tell you how often when I get retained, the client doesn't have all the documents because uh, oftentimes they're, they're documents that are just downloaded um, from, you know, the Internet when you sign a license agreement or when you agree to a click through agreement. And unfortunately, oftentimes people don't have a regimen in place where they um, have a procedure where those documents immediately get downloaded and um, and filed in a central repository. So if you don't have such a um, such a procedure in place, you should implement that and make sure that um, that people are downloading those agreements and filing them away. And that, by the way, also includes uh, downloading and filing away um, any hyperlink document in the agreement. Um, that's important too. So, um, so that's the first thing, you know, assemble all the documents and then basically read the documents and, and, uh, you know, they'd be very complicated. Okay. So, um, but, you know, definitely read the audit clause, um, and, and get a sense for what obligations that you have. And then, um, when you actually, um, get the audit notice, there will end up being things that are focused on um, in the audit. And so um, you can actually then even refine your your focus a little bit um, at that time. Now, um, one thing that's really important is this is the time to actually conduct your own pre-audit. And I actually recommend that, you know, at the very least have your internal team um, under the direction of your legal department, um, performing the pre-audit. 
Um, but uh, you can also retain outside consultants under the direction of your legal team um, who can help you do a pre-audit to try to understand if you have compliance issues and if you do, then how to remediate those. Um, and, you know, so you will basically, you know, get into compliance. Um, and uh, another another thing that is really good for you to do is gather all of the previous audit correspondence that you might have. Um, oftentimes in resolving a later audit, you're able to go back um, to representations that were made in resolving a previous audit. And you're able to say, hey, look, auditors, um, you're now saying this in your final report that we owe, but this is what, how you told us to do it. And here's the email that shows it. And, and here's what uh, you told us to do at that time. We did. And now you're here um, taking the position that we are non-compliant, but we're following your directions. So, um, and then there are other good tidbits that could be in there. So you really do want to uh, make sure that you have uh, uh, all that audit co correspondence ha handy. Um, you also wanna assemble your um, audit team um, and, uh, Basically, you know, figure out who's going to be the key point of contact and uh, who will be on, you know, the technical side, the, the business side, and, you know, what works for your organization and get those folks in place so that when inevitably the audit notice does happen and, and it drops, you're, re you're ready to go. And also, uh, if you don't have your own legal department, or sometimes even if you do, um, you may want to consider retaining outside counsel, such as tactical law, such as myself, to assist you, you know, in this process and um, and 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 get you in a compliance position um, uh, where you're ready to face uh, an audit. Um, so that's what I would say, you know, it's really important. Prepare, prepare, prepare um, before you get that audit notice. This is the time to figure out your environment, what are your risk areas, and to try to take care of that and get into compliance. Um, also, people wonder, you know, how can, uh, why am I being audited? You know, I've never been audited before. Well, I've heard more than one expert consultant, I, I work with a lot of ex, expert consultants in this audit space, say that basically if you're not being audited by someone like Oracle, it may mean that you're actually paying Oracle too much money and um, they don't want to rock the boat. It's, it's when you're not paying Oracle what they consider to be enough money, they say, um, that will cause, you know, an audit to happen. But there's other things as well. And uh, if any of these things are about ready to happen or just happened, you should know that your company could be, you know, um, in line for an audit. Uh, basically, if the company is expanding, say that there's been a big merger or acquisition or, you know, a lot of employee growth for some reason. Um, it appears from what I can see that uh, these software publishers do a good job of researching the company and keeping their eye out on something like M&A activity. So if you have had a merger, don't be surprised if, uh, if you're going to get an audit. Um, Another reason is poor internal controls. So, for example, a failure to meet uh, a reporting requirement. So if your license agreement requires that you report something annually and you don't do it and you miss that deadline, that could trigger uh, an audit. Um, another one that we see is somebody, one of your employees requests training for software that you're not licensed for. And that's a big red flag. They'll they'll jump on that um, because unfortunately, there's so much software out there 
and I think publishers do this on purpose to make it really easy for it to be downloaded and put on your work system. And um, and it's hard to control that. Um, and so and then if if somebody is actually not authorized by the company to do that, but they they go out and, and do it anyway, um, the company could be on the hook uh, for complying with that license agreement. So then if they download software that their company is not licensed for and they request training on it, that's a huge red flag and you could get an audit notice. Another one along the same vein is support tickets for unlicensed programs. Um, that's a big red flag. Um, other things that can trigger an audit, other outside events, um, the sales team. Uh, the sales team is the one, no matter what they tell you, they'll point the finger at uh, the audit team, uh, L LMS or Glass in the case of Oracle. But in reality, from what we can see, it's actually the sales team. And if the sales team doesn't believe that you're buying enough software, it's almost like they just walk across the hall to the uh, audit team and say, audit them. And then they use that, uh, that those audits to make a lot of money. Um, another type of event that could cause your company to be audited is if a private equity firm buys um, you know, your software publisher. Um, that happens all the time, and um, that that could cause, uh, you know, the audit philosophy to change. Um, another uh, uh, thing that could cause more audits is, uh, even if it's not a private equity firm, if it's a company that actually really likes to monetize its copyrights, and if they acquire your publisher, um, one uh, one publisher that I think we're going to be seeing a lot more audits from going forward is VMware. And that's because VMware was recently acquired by Broadcom. And so Broadcom is known for their aggressive audit strategies. So if you have VMware in your environment, now's the time to figure out and make sure you're compliant because I think you're going to be seeing some audits uh, coming down the pike not too far away. Um, Another issue is uh, IT changes. Um, if you do a hardware refresh or there's a change in your IT infrastructure or you have virtualization software like VMware, that could trigger an audit um, because, you know, if you do a hardware refresh, it may be that you're using servers which have many more cores than before. And a lot of software is based on the number of cores. And so, that's something that will get the attention of the sales team. Now, there are both formal audits and informal audits. Um, you know, uh, and some auditors, some companies call it a license review instead of an audit, but a license review is an audit, <laughs> so don't be fooled by it, okay? Um, and, you know, like I said, the audits can be formal or informal. And it's if it's a formal one, you'll know because you'll get an audit notice letter and it'll say, uh, we are initiating an audit pursuant to our agreement, you know, this particular paragraph. Uh, please understand you have so many days to respond. Um, and uh, they will start the audit process. Uh, that's the time for you to make sure that you go to your software license to the audit clause. And again, make sure that um, you're taking uh, whatever time, you know, the the uh, contract allows you. For example, Oracle says upon 45 days notice, we can audit you. They'll try to push you to start the audit before the 45 days has elapsed. But you want to actually push back on that and take your whole 45 days. Um, in addition to these formal audits, there are uh, soft audits, and these are by the sales teams. Um, this is happening a lot right now with Oracle in the Java space, and um, so you really need to watch it. Java software has something in it that can call home to the Oracle mothership and let Oracle know that a certain company at this IP address is using their software. And then that can cause the Java sales team, which is 
really aggressive sales team over at Oracle, the, mo- the most aggressive one I've seen, to actually contact your company. And they usually start out by saying, they don't say they're auditing you. They start out by saying that they understand that maybe, you know, you're using Java and they want to help you right size your, your Java subscription. Or they say, um, we have a really uh, important security patch and we want to make sure that you um, that you have that security patch because it's really important to protect your organization. So they start these conversations and then the IT department usually, you know, innocently is trying to be helpful, uh, starts giving all this information without there being a formal audit, even without uh, t- uh elevating this to the legal department, which you should do. If somebody, if any software publisher starts a- asking for information like that, you need to carefully consider what you need to provide and you should uh, call your legal department, make sure you get their input. Um, but what's been happening in these Java audits is that, uh, you know, the c- customer starts to innocently you know, provide this information. And the next thing they know, uh, the conversation goes from friendly to really hardcore. You know, you're you're non-compliant. You need to pay, and um, and it's a usually a huge bill. Um, and companies, f- frankly, are kind of shell shocked by it. So, don't provide the information. Um, make sure if they want to audit you, they have to issue a formal audit notice, and. Um, Make sure that your IT employees know this, that they should not be volunteering a bunch of information to these software publishers. Um, The other thing you want to do, and I kind of touched on this with uh, Oracle, the 45 days and the audit clause and to take the time, is look at the audit clause. Are there any protections in there for the customer? For example, Oracle's uh, clauses say that they can't unreasonably interfere with your normal business operations. So you want to know what your rights are and what your potential protections are. Um, when the meeting, uh, you know, when, when the audit kicks off, uh, and if the time for you to respond hasn't run yet, you definitely want to decline those early meetings, um, and uh, and you know get get your team prepared. You also need to agree on the audit scope because you don't want, you know, scope creeping up um, over the life of the audit. So you want to you want to talk to um, to the publisher about that and make sure that you're agreed on the audit scope so that they can't, you know, uh, increase that on you um, and, and, you know, when you're not suspecting it. Uh, it's also possible to say if it's a bad time to say, you know, hey, uh, Oracle, or hey, Quest, or hey, Microfocus, um, we got this audit notice. We're really super duper busy right now with all of these projects. Is it possible to delay this for three months or six months? Um, sometimes they'll do it. Sometimes uh, they won't. But it certainly doesn't hurt to ask. Um, now, what are some of the rules of the roads uh, for these audits? Um, and again, we touched on this briefly. So um, one thing is establish your internal procedures and stick to it. OK, you want to designate one point of contact for the audit. And and the, these software publishers will try to go around that person, over that person, every which way to evade that person. But every time they try that, you need to slap the wrist and point them back to that one point of contact. And all the communications go through that person. You want to keep a record of all communication with the auditors and with any sales personnel um, about the audit. Um, Keep your emails, take notes of meetings, ask to record meetings. Um, If you are in a meeting and the uh, software publishers or the auditors flash up, you know, um, a PowerPoint, ask for a copy of it. Um, and take good notes that you keep as to what they're saying. Um, You also want to vet with your outside counsel and their expert consultants um, what data um, 
you should be providing to the auditors. Um, they will often ask for a bunch of information that they're not entitled to and it's not relevant to your usage of their software. And you need to prepare for that and you, you need to make sure that that's not happening. Um, now, with regard to how do you communicate with the auditors, what you find is that all they want to do is get on the phone with you, okay? And they send you invites to endless meetings. And I think they do that for a couple of reasons. The first reason is they don't want any anything in writing that could be used against them. So they would rather tell you these kind of outrageous and take these outrageous positions verbally in meetings so that they have plausible deniability. And they can say, oh, you know, I never, you know, we never said that, you know. Um, and so um, that's important. I think they also like to judge how, you know, nervous you are about the audit so they know how much pressure they can put on you. Um, and also, I think um, they want to ask you stuff uh, to try to get you to react instantly without having thought through it. And that doesn't help you either. So you want to insist that all communications be in writing and you want to um, you want to decline those in-person meetings. And um, that's really important. And, and people will say, well, can't I just get on the phone with them? You know, and I say, no, you shouldn't get on the phone with them. OK, you should keep the um, communication uh, in writing. And you need to build your records. So you always want any communications to uh, the publisher, the sales, or the auditors to be you know, professional, um, something that if it ended up in litigation, you would be comfortable with a court or a jury reading. Um, and you know, by keeping this uh, all this in 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 written form. Uh, you basically are preparing a record that could be very useful for you to show that you were cooperating with the audit in the event of litigation. Um, also, if they ask for certain information, the auditors ask them why they need that information. If they want to run certain scripts, ask them what the purpose of the scripts is and make sure that you're comfortable running the scripts because Many of the software license agreements don't say that uh, they have the right to run scripts, and oftentimes uh, companies will decline those requests. Um, we talked about the scope of the audit. You know, you need to identify at the outset what programs are under audit, and you need to keep the auditors focused on those programs and not have scope creep. And you probably want to execute an NDA um, to make sure that you're communications are confidential, um, although um, sometimes you you might want not want to do that because you may want to use some of the communications uh, that they that the publisher sends you against them in the event of litigation. So I can go both ways on that. Um, also, uh, many times license agreements have NDAs. But um, but you certainly don't want um, the publisher disclosing your confidential information. Um, they they really don't tend to you know really be wanting to do that. But you may want to have the flexibility to disclose in a court proceeding what they've been telling you. Um, you should also prepare your management that. Um, the auditors may escalate internally, so if they're not getting uh, the right response from whoever is the one point of contact and they don't feel like they're getting all the documents that they want, they'll escalate it to the CTO or to the CFO or to the CEO. And so you need to make sure that those people know that that could happen, know that you're working on the audit, that you have a team assembled, and that if if Oracle or Quest or whoever it is escalates to that person, they need to refer them back to the one point of contact and not engage. Um, you also need to prepare management that oftentimes these auditors, when they issue their final reports, um, they contain usually what I call a shock and awe number. And that's a number that, you know, really has no basis in reality, 
but um, they put it in there um, because they want to just freak out the customer so that they scare you into making uh, the purchase of the software. And um, so it's important that you, you know, not be cowed by that um, and that instead you work with your your audit team and your outside counsel and your expert consultants to really figure out, you know, what in there is real and what is not real and just methodically push back on overreaching claims of noncompliance. Um, you want to brief your management and keep them informed of what's going on with the audit again so that no one is surprised if uh, if Oracle or the publisher tries to escalate. Um, I, I've talked about creating your record, use your professional tone in the correspondence, ask questions. Um, if the auditors are being unreasonable and interfering with your normal business operations, document that. Um, control the timing of the communications. Uh, don't, don't, you know, let them always control the timings like, like you're a, you know, trained dog. Um, you want to uh, you want to be reasonable. You want to cooperate, but don't feel like you have to get back to them that day or even the next day. You want to keep the cadence of the communications um, as such that it, you're not jumping through their hoops. Um, if they try to say in writing that you're actually delaying, um, you want to push back on those allegations of delay and you want to keep everything in writing. You don't want to waive any rights and uh, use previous writings as ammunition, such as what I said earlier, which is, uh, you know, um, correspondence that may be from a previous audit. So once you get the audit report, um, that can take a couple of uh, different forms. There could be an interim report, which is like maybe a draft report, and uh, they provide that to key stakeholders, it's got the shock number in there um, and they put it out there kind of to see how you react. Um, you want to begin to push back immediately on the shock number um, and you want to make clear that you dispute the results. I've had multiple clients um, uh, where uh, Oracle or another publisher has said, hey, you know, we gave you this report. We delivered the report. You sat in a meeting and you never objected. We thought you agreed. So you want to make it clear in a professional way that you're going to look at their report, you're going to analyze the results, but that you do dispute the, the report. Um, what we found is, uh, and then after the interim report, they could issue the final audit report. I've never seen one that wasn't riddled with errors. Um, you want to request that the errors be corrected and you want to conduct your own assessment. Um, uh, you conduct your own assessment with your legal team and uh, and your internal team. You carefully analyze the reports. You refuse, again, refuse demands for calls and meetings. The, they're really going to, the publishers are really going to try to get you on the phone. And again, they want to, they want to see how they're impacting you, um, you know, and you want to, you don't want that. You don't want them to see that. You don't want them to see you in disarray or to smell the fear or, you know, any of that. You want to, um, Keep it, keep it in writing, keep it objective, um, and continue building your record. Um, and again, you want to prepare management for all the reasons that we've mentioned before. Then after you've prepared your pushback, when you know what your real true exposure is, and take your time to get there, okay? They may say you only have 30 days and everything, but usually as long as you're engaging in discussions, they'll be fairly reasonable. Um, then you negotiate your audit resolution. Uh, it's good to know when a fiscal or quarter in for the publisher is because you can exploit those um, ends to try to get a better deal because they're really motivated um to try to close a deal and you'll you'll find that and especially year end that you get the the best deals then um ignore their ultimatums the foot stamping you know all that keep it professional they're always going to say that the uh, proposal will be off the table if you don't accept it by a certain time you better accept it the discounts are going to go away um 
I've never seen that to really happen. They discounts always come back and they're usually better. So, you know, don't let them control you like that. Don't be afraid to escalate to the Oracle legal department. The sales teams absolutely hate that because it takes the process out of their hands. But frankly, the Oracle legal department, they're made up of really smart, competent lawyers who understand risk. And um, and they are much more likely to be able to help you to resolve the dispute than the sales team. And then you negotiate the resolution. Um, usually audits are resolved by an ordering document where you order more software. And uh, also you want to negotiate a closed letter to make sure that it's clear that uh, you know, by making those purchases, even though you don't agree that you were out of compliance, but nonetheless, by making those purchases, you're resolving any concerns from the audit and the audit is closed. So that's basically the process in a nutshell. Um, I hope that you find that helpful. Um, and uh, audits are hard. Um, audits are ubiquitous and audits are just going to grow. Um, so if there's any uh, time that you receive an audit notice or a, a soft audit or just an inquiry, and you need um, to talk to somebody who has a lot of experience in this area, we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, again, my name is Pam Fulmer, and I thank you very much for your time today. Bye-bye. Thank you once again, Pam, for sharing your expertise with us. It is valuable expertise. Please reach out to Pam with ways that she or tactical law can help you and your organization. Now, a word from our sponsor, Service Management. Is your asset management program or CMDB sick? If your asset management program or CMDB is not healthy and you want to get either of them checked out, service management leadership will diagnose the issues. We will provide you with a free initial consultation and assessment. The short assessment includes a review of your metrics and tools. This includes what you are measuring and why, plus your tools and integration a meeting with stakeholders to understand their needs. Most issues originate from unstated or unmet stakeholder expectations. We will ask the right questions. We will then summarize our findings at a high level and give you a proposal that discusses next steps. What makes service management leadership different than most consultancies you encounter is a holistic approach that comes from being in the industry for a few decades. Yes, decades. Our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller, began in the asset management industry in May of 1994. Our approach includes an end-to-end -end understanding of your processes. The holistic approach also includes an understanding of your current state tools and what you want to accomplish. The most important aspect of our holistic approach is the alignment of activities to the needs of stakeholders. 
every action or effort that is not aligned to what your stakeholders need is wasted. Our approach also includes a review of your in-house expertise. Lastly, our approach includes an understanding of your current metrics and reporting and what is needed. If you are not getting the value needed from your asset management program or your CMDB, contact Jeffrey Tieferteller and our team of experts at Service Management Leadership. Next up is Rory Canavan with Sam Charter. Rory does a great job with a process view of asset management, software asset management, and has really become a big voice in the industry. His topic today is gonna to be on machine learning and its impact on software asset management. I thought Rory might appreciate this shirt as we think about assets, asset registers, a list of all assets the organization has lost or soon will replace. Assets are a great investment, but they're difficult to keep track of. Now here's Rory sharing his knowledge with us, and we thank him for doing so. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rory Canavan, and today I'm going to give you a presentation on machine learning and software asset management, or at least my understanding of machine learning. Um, I've seen a lot of posts recently about um, the role of artificial intelligence in IT asset management, and I've not seen anything on a more core component of that um, AI, as it were, and that is machine learning. So. Uh, um, hopefully over the next 30 minutes now, I'm going to give you something of an introduction to the topic and um, maybe it will give you something you can take away and actually apply to your own organisation. So what are we going to talk about or what am I going to talk about? What are you going to listen to? Um, I've got five, five primary aspects to this presentation. Uh, firstly, what is a neural network? How can we apply this to SAM? Tips and tricks when applying key performance indicators as they form a, uh, a crucial part of uh, machine learning. That whole thing of you can't uh, manage what you don't measure. Finally, tips and tricks to apply to the machine learning model itself. So there's um, some, some aspects to watch out for there that, um, um, uh, that you wouldn't possibly think of if you just sort of threw your model up and said, right, let's see what it comes out with. Finally, um, any contact details. So if you do have any questions um, around the presentation or indeed you wish to get in touch um, generally around SAM or ITAM, then please feel free to do so. And also some references and, and, and acknowledgements as well. I did actually do a tiny bit of research to uh, save myself doing a bit of drawing there. So uh, there's a, a few images to uh, uh, to say thank you for that. So let's get this show on the road. What is a neural network? Uh, and I appreciate you could look at this diagram for this first time and, and look at all the statistical and mathematical notations and go, oh no, please. Um, but it's not uh, quite as complicated um, as all that mathematical notation. We can um, simplify it somewhat. And hopefully, as I take you through the, the SAM version, um, life will become a bit easier in explaining this. Um, the reason it's called a neural network is because it is believed this is how the brain works from the point of view that all these little circles represent neurons in your brains and the arrows represent the synapses that communicate between the neurons. Now when electrical impulses fire from one neuron to another they um, they go through a little machination, a little weighting, if you will. So you'll see there W11, W12, W13, etc. Whatever data or input is gathered at the input layer on the left hand side goes through a weighting before it reaches the hidden layer. Um, now, what's what's a practical application of this? Well, when I did some studying many moons ago, um, 
when I when I was at university, um, I had to uh, go through an AI module and machine learning was part of this. Um, and I found a paper uh, from the IEEE on work that I think MIT had done to help the US Navy recognize um, sonar signatures of uh, submarines. And so if you imagine that a sonar wave came in from the left hand side and hit these input layers, what you're looking to do is to empower the captain of a, of a submarine, the ability to determine whether that sonar wave is in fact a submarine, um, is it friendly, is it foe, um, is it a school of fish, is it a whale, um, is it a sunken wreck, um, and, and an interesting parallel to this, um, if any of you can remember back in the day when um, the hunt for Red October came out, they did a, a sort of a little doffing of caps in the direction of sonar um, technology and methodology, and indeed neural networks as well. Um, when they were talking about training Simon Beaumont um, when he detected his first whale at sea on USS Dallas. Um, so that's a, shall we say, a practical application in the real world. What data comes into the left is your call. What output you want at the right hand side is your call. But the thing to take away from that example is, of course, that the US Navy or any foreign Navy is not just going to sit there with a submarine and say, hey, US Navy, ping us from all angles. Um, so you get an absolute complete picture of what our submarines look like underwater through sonar. They're not going to do it. So you've got to be stealthy uh, to, to build up this picture because it's not going to be a one time ping. And that represents that model and make of submarine. It's going to take a lot of data um, from various angles, from various depths, from various distances um, to build up that sort of machine learning so that you have you will have an ultimate optimal ping of what that submarine actually is. Um, but what if it's 75 percent or what if it's 60 percent? Um, a, a figure that we arrive at the output layer. What we're looking to do is to be able to empower the intelligence in this instance, who would be the US, uh, would be the, the, the captain of the submarine to say, yes, that is a school of fish or yes, that is a whale or yes, actually, we're going to pursue that sonar ping because we believe it to be a submarine that is worthy of our attention. Um, what you'll also notice is between the hidden layer and the output layer, there are further weightings applied as well. And then we arrive at an output layer for that final yes, go, no decision. Um, so I think that's that's enough now for neural networks and uh, and submarines, because I'm sure that wasn't what you were looking to tune into for. Um, so let's push on to the next slide and see how we can actually apply this to software asset management. Now. What I don't want to do is to scare you um, with this mahusive image, um, but I do want to introduce to you the uh, the model that we built um, purely based on um, the item accelerate process kit. So what you'll see in this particular model are 32 processes that run along the uh, the input layer, if you will. And then we've got higher considerations as to what goals or ambitions we want Sam to actually achieve. And so the inputs of the KPIs won't go to every aspect of Sam. So if you pick, for example, um, improved security, um, you're not necessarily going to pick each and every Sam process that is going to contribute to improved security. So that's why the lines you'll see on the screen here are coloured. And I'm going to um, offer a, a, an expanded image of this so that we can uh, we can actually talk around it in greater detail. So here's a, um, a, a snapshot of that image to save your eyesight. 
Um, and the example I want to uh, focus on here is number six. So we've got software hygiene and it only has two inputs because for the purposes of this presentation, hygiene is keeping the IT estate lean. <clears throat> so for that primary goal, um, we're looking at the software removal process at number 12, and it's just getting clipped off the screen there. We have software recycling and license optimization process at number nine. So obviously the recycling activity that takes place keeps the IT estate fresh in real time. Um, and towards the end of the life cycle, we've got the removal activity as well. So when software goes end of life, we should be removing it and um, potentially uh, replacing it also if it if that sort of functionality is still needed, but can't be um, uh, delivered with software that is obviously end of life. Companies get very tetchy about that kind of thing. Now let's talk about the waiting because it could be, for example, that um, um, you're, you're starting out in SAM and for whatever reason, um, you believe things are a proper mess that, that there's been no recycling in a lifetime. Well, where do you actually start with that? Well, you could start at the end, for example, and say um, there's an 80% waiting on these activities to make sure that we get rid of technology that is no longer supported. So you would put 0.8, if you will, on the input of the percentage coming from the software removal process. And then as you start to gain traction and these titles start to disappear and you start to see the, the, the wheat for the chaff, as it were, um, you might think, well, OK, let's start thinking about the unused software that's sitting on the IT estate not doing very much. If we've got software that we've rolled out and we're not using it, let's get the IT estate lean. Let's get that down. So uh, we'll put a 20% weighting on our recycling there. Um, but over time, what you're going to find, of course, is that that dead wood at the end of the life cycle that is no longer supported is going to go down. So that 0.8 weighting that comes from the KPI generated by the removal process, that could come down to potentially 0.3 or 0.4, because now you're starting to get your IT estate in some semblance of order. Um, and, and the remaining weighting could then go on the recycling because now all of a sudden, well, let's let's focus on the now. Let's see um, what software we can remove and put back into the license pool to one of those requests that come through for people who actually want to use the software rather than just have it on their laptops because their workmates have it. So those weightings are to be played with. Once we take that weighting and it could be just a straight addition of the two value of the two percentage values for software hygiene and we arrive at a statistical value um and again it's it's that thing of um educating the uh, the model that you know we look at this data monthly how are we doing monthly how are we doing weekly potentially and where do the weightings sit what sort of calculation do we actually need to comprise to have a good definition for software hygiene as well so it could be that you just crash the two percentages together and you say, there you go, there's our final outcome for software hygiene as a performance related matter in support of SAM at the top. Um, or you could rather like the first image, go into some sort of, you know, statistical uh, matriculation that um, has everybody scratching their heads and going, huh? Um, I leave that to the model builders, to the machine learning builders and good luck to them. But what you see then are the, the lines ultimately go up to the final tier, the output layer then at that point. And this you uh, arguably could, these top two layers, these hidden layers, you could it turn into dashboards potentially for senior management <clears throat> to make informed decisions as to where they go with software asset management. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but each node in the hidden layer has a weighting as well as it contributes to that overall image. So I've color coded these because it, it's just easier on the eye. You, you get some idea of uh, where the weightings go. And what you'll also notice is as well, for example, the software recycling number nine contributes to more than one node above it. So it goes to asset utilization and review. I'm sorry, the yellow lines aren't as clear as they could be. Join as movers, leavers, 
and there's one that's shot off the page there at the end as well, which I don't recall. So um, there's no reason why more than one node at the input layer can't contribute to the hidden layer or the calculation layer above it. So tips and tricks when applying KPIs. This is um, often uh, quite important when we think about this. Try and make your um, KPI generation systematic. So what you don't want to do is, is employ somebody with a pen and a, and a clipboard and you know, make it a manual activity. Um, increasingly, the, uh, the manner and means by which SAM suites are producing data, we've gone beyond compliance reports now. We're starting to delve into that idea of uh, getting performance to statistics out of uh, processes, out of activities, um, out of base data gathering. Um, so let let the technology do the heavy lifting to uh, gain those uh, those values. Try and make the format the same. So when we talked about um, the example of the sonar and the submarine, essentially it's a sound wave that is going back to all the input layers then at that point. So that's quite important to bear in mind. Um, we didn't necessarily take the temperature of the sea, the distance of the ping. That comes into the overall calculation and equation, but we don't necessarily have that, um, uh, if you will, we, we don't have an, uh, an output layer for that in the, um, in the neural network model. Being on the SMART acronym, so uh, that's specific, measurable, attributable, realistic, and time-based. So when we pick these calculations, um, we should be looking to um, have some sort of statistical analysis as to what it is we're actually uh, measuring at the input layer. Um, th they have to have meaning and value as well. So um, stuff that is ethereal about how does it make you feel? Are you happy after having run through the process? Those things are too variable to be actually um, of any value in contributing to the uh, neural network and its means and ability to learn. Try and make sure too that any KPIs actually support some maturity as well moving forward, because if you're going to use a machine learning model, there has to be an ultimate goal. What is the zenith of what it is we're seeking to achieve? And um, it's it's interesting that we talk about this um, because we're at, at the top node or the output uh, node, as I as I had it modelled in the previous image, it was Sam, good Sam, Tom, if you want to call it that. Um, a particular example that was highlighted to me, I had a, a colleague who was talking to a. Uh, um, a, a former CIO of a European bank, uh, and he was talking about his various SAM and ITEM offerings about how we can, um, through this tool or this activity, we can demonstrate cost avoidance or we can highlight cost savings. We can talk about, uh, you know, reduced security risk. And the ex CIO stopped him there and said, right away, you're pitching this all wrong. He said, what you need to be talking about is the money the bank sets aside for regulatory and auditory risk. And that pot is calculated based on um, the percentage of risk that the bank feels it is in um, as a result of those audits. Therefore, if you can demonstrate KPIs that reduce that level of risk, they can reduce that pot of money that they set to one side. And at that point, they're in a position to do something with that money. And that is a real win-win for any bank. So having some appreciation or context of the, um, the application of the machine that is doing the learning and the model that is being built is, um, is really quite important and, uh, and can make all the difference in what it is you're reporting and how you're seeking to report it. Have a mind too that um, is 100% a realistic ambition, and we, I think we, we seniors, if you will, in the Sam and the ITAM space, 
um, you know, we we have that notion uh, well and truly battered into our heads with regards to uh, gaining 100% of our inventory estate, you know, or the inventory data off from our IT estate. Um, you're always going to have those um, off network or, or remote devices that aren't live to the network. Um, and there may be some gray areas too on whether technology is IT, information technology, or whether it's operational technology and somebody else should be reporting on it. Or there could be geographic boundaries and uh, France or Germany decide we're going our own way. Or maybe that should be the United Kingdom. Um, but yeah, there's um, all these factors play into whether that actually, you know, getting 100% for, uh, for a process is absolutely optimal. And what you'll find as well is that percentage, if you will, of uh, of a target at the input layer. Um, the machine learning is designed to cope with the variances. So if, for example, you are aiming at 75 percent and you only hit 70 or you exceed 80, then that's what the machine learning is looking to do is to determine whether that is good, bad or indifferent. Or do we unleash the hounds? Um, you know, what weighting do we apply to that statistic as it comes through and feeds into the higher calculations? Are you gunning for ISO 19770-1 certification? And the reason I mentioned this is because um, this model of taking performance data and feeding it up through um, management plans, operation management plans, through processes, through then to uh, strategic asset plans uh, and reporting there too is going to be really really helpful um so there are worse ways to do this rather than uh you know to to sort of report on higher business and it functions um than to uh, just generate a compliance report and hope that you've done everything okay So tips and tricks to apply to the machine learning model. And I'm, if, if I've covered some of these already, I, I do apologize. Um, but waiting for the inputs in the mid tier should not exceed 100%, regardless of how many inputs it takes from the lower tier. What you're going to find is that if you do give extra weighting over and above 100%, you skew the hidden layer neuron. It's going to take precedence over the others. And what you're going, what you really want to be able to do is to look at that middle tier. I think the eight, um, the eight hidden uh, nodes, as we had it in the SAM example, and be able to compare them like for like. Now, if you do want to skew the outputs of those, that's where the weightings from the hidden layer to the output layer take place. So don't feel that. Um, Oh well, uh, software hygiene is more important than all the others, um, but we can't use we can't get that influence somewhere into the overall image of how that gets to good sound. You absolutely can. You can put a heavier weighting on the output of that node um, into the definition of SAM at the top. At this point, too, we talked about it with the submarine example. Um, the um, the depth of the water, the distance of the water, those those aspects require you to take multiple sets of data and throw them at the model. Um, and that's going to give you the ability to adjust or tweak the weightings between the input layer and the hidden layer. Or then think about to um, what calculations are actually taking place in the uh, the hidden layer. And as we said there, don't forget to apply weightings uh, to the output layer then from the hidden layers. So um, um, as we mentioned there, if if recycling or hygiene is, is of, of particular import to um, the vision or image of what SAM actually looks like, you can put a heavier weighting on that as it feeds into the, uh, the overall sum as it reports up to the top of the output layer. So that takes me pretty much to the uh, the end of this uh, quite short presentation, but I hope you got something from it. Um, please find attached or see on the screen there my contact details. If you do have um, any questions or you would do wish to to get in touch, I'm always about on LinkedIn. 
that too is my LinkedIn photo. So, because um, I, I know there's a few Rory Canavans bouncing around. Um, that just leaves me to um, acknowledge Astro ML for their um, image on the uh, third slide, I think it was, on what a, uh, a neural network could conceivably look like. The remaining two images were from the Sam Charter vaults. So I thank myself for that. Um, and also as well, the uh, reference to the 32 processors, uh, they come from the ITAM Accelerate process kit. So that's again, myself and Kylie uh, Fowler for, uh, thank you. Thank you to Kylie for letting me use that for the purposes of this demonstration. Um, finally, of course, thank you to Jeffrey T. Fertilla of uh, Service Management Leadership for letting me present today. I'm not looking at the time and I haven't looked at my uh, phone or my watch, so I pray this is coming in on the uh, or around the 30 minute mark and is fit for purpose. If not, I might have to do this again. <laughs> so um, so there we go. Um, thank you very much for your time and for watching this. And if you do have any questions, do please get in touch. Thank you once again, Pam, for sharing your expertise with us. It is valuable expertise. Please reach out to Pam with ways that she or Tactical Law can help you and your organization. Now, a word from our sponsor, Service Management. Service management is complex. Each organization will have its own unique complexities. Solving these complexities is hard, very hard, because these turbulent times have caused changing organizational priorities. The increased dependence on partners has only increased complexities. Every organization has a shortage of in-house expertise. The technologies, integrations, and reliance on data has increased the complexities exponentially. Now we are asked to incorporate emerging technologies into our already complex environment. Solving these complexities is the only way to deliver value in today's service management world. Fact. Most leaders are unhappy, very unhappy, with the value derived from their service management programs. Value is elusive, but it must come from getting the most out of your people, processes, and technology. And all three must work together. Every leader must ask themselves this one question. Are you getting enough value from your service management investments? IT service management solves business problems, not technical problems, as said frequently by our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller. To solve the complexities and deliver optimal value, we must focus on the business problems that need to be solved and align our activities accordingly. Jeffrey and service management leadership have solved this for many companies and organizations and can do so for you. They are experts in getting the most from service management investments. If you are not getting the desired value from your service management investment, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller at Service Management Leadership today. Help is on the way. Thank you for your participation in this Global ITAM Summit. My presentation today is on the value of having a great program management for your asset management capability. 
there are many dollars, risks, and decisions to be made and leveraged by doing asset management well at a program level. Our specialists, our experts have told us so much about why we need to think about their specific area. My topic is more of a general capability within an organization. I thought you might like this shirt, cloud management, paying extra for servers in someone else's data center, as I feel like that is so true in today's world. That's why many organizations are bringing their cloud workloads back on premise, just because the value wasn't there for whatever reason. That's a topic for a different day. But let me know what you think of this presentation, and I look forward to your feedback. And thank you once again for joining us on the Global ITAM Summit. My name is Jeffrey T. Fertiller, and in this session, we will talk about the building blocks of an effective asset management program. Before I get started, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge and show my appreciation to the other hosts and guests who are sharing their expertise, their knowledge, their life, and how they have gained all this expertise with us. They did not gain this expertise overnight, and it took them many years to be able to be so talented and so much of a wealth of expertise for us. This presentation is going to be about an asset management program view. Why do we care? Why is it needed? And what's in it for us if we do asset management better? Most organizations struggle with the basics. I don't think that's news to anyone. Having the best tools, that will not make you successful. Having the best people on the planet on your team, that'll help, but that will not guarantee your success. Outsourcing to the best vendor, sure, that may help you make incremental progress, but it won't ensure your success. Each of these help, but success is predicated on two things. Executive support. Most of us have been in situations where we either had executive support and were very thankful, or we didn't have that support from the executives and from our leaders, and it was painful, and it was difficult. And then the second thing that success is predicated on is what I would like to discuss today. It's a strong program level strategy and execution. In the next few minutes, we'll talk about why we need to establish this program level view and how do we execute our strategy and how do we do things better. A few weeks ago, on LinkedIn, I put out a poll. I like LinkedIn polls. It helps me understand what other people are struggling with. So the question was, which area of IT asset management does your organization struggle with the most? I was surprised, frankly, that overall program management was the highest in this poll. The topic and area that people struggled with and thought about and had anxiety over and leaders worried about how do we do things better. Software licensing had 28%, hardware tracking, life cycle. If you think about who owns what laptop and where is it located and what is our life cycle for that hardware, that's very important as well. And cloud utilization, also very important. I was I was surprised that program management ranked so highly. So why do we care about ITAM program leadership? I like this picture of this man who has a big jigsaw puzzle spread over the kitchen table. I know many families that really enjoy puzzles together. We find this blue patch and we're trying to make all the puzzle pieces fit the picture on the outside of the box. 
the thing about puzzles is it takes a while sometimes. It may take days or weeks, but there's a momentum that's gained. And so it's also good to do it as a group. And while many organizations do aspects of asset management well, they may do cloud well or hardware well or software well, there still needs this aspect of how do all these pieces of asset management go together? And not only how do they go together, but how do we assemble them to best deliver the outcomes for our business stakeholders? And when we think about it, that is the why we do things. How do we deliver these outcomes for these business stakeholders? Because the focus must be on our business outcomes. When we think of why do we do ITAM? Why do we do IT asset management? The focus must be on those business outcomes. And we'll talk about a few of those in just a few minutes. But I wanted to direct our thoughts at the very beginning of all these puzzle pieces are out there and we can do things well, but it takes putting all those puzzle pieces together that really adds the value. So when we think of our business outcomes, I like the picture of the chess pieces. It represents our decisions. We have many decisions from a business point of view, whether we invest in IT asset management or something else. So our IT asset management should help this overall organizational decision-making. It may be helping us identify technical debt. It may help us understand the life cycle of our assets, or even how do we help plan and budget for our renewals. The picture with all of the money, I think many of us would love to dive in and swim around in a big bathtub of money. Too bad those are just $1 bills instead of hundreds, right? But another business outcome besides the decisions is how do we how do we maximize our investments, our costs that we have in our IT assets. And third, you see the danger button. We have risk. Every organization has many types of risk. IT asset management is a very big aspect of us understanding the risk in our IT organization and even our broader organization. The risk could be related to security. It could be related to many other aspects. But decisions, cost optimization, and risk management are the three main business outcomes that our stakeholders desire. And that should be our focus. There are a lot of savings available. I like this slide. It's from the Flexera 2023 Tech Spend Pulse. It's the estimated wasted technology spend. Think about on your desktop software. Mainly, you could have some wasted hardware spend. But we have mainly desktop software spend that goes to waste. And we don't initially and intuitively think about all the software that's on our desktop. Yes, we have Windows. Yes, we have Office, but we have so much more that lives on our desktops that we do not utilize well. If you think about a 27% waste, that's a large number. 23% waste in our data center software spending. We spend a lot in our data centers for software. 23% represents a big number. 21% wasted for software as a service spend is huge. And I say that because many organizations are switching and evolving from data center software to software as a service. And so this 21% is a big number. I actually thought it would be larger because very few organizations 
monitor the utilization and the spend within their SaaS applications. And lastly, 19% wasted in our infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. These are some big numbers when you think most organizations spend 20, 30 million, some spend in the billions that I know of and I've worked with. So if you took an average of 22, 23% off of a billion dollars, that's a lot of money. Maybe enough for us to take a bathtub in those dollar bills or hundreds. Here's a, another Flexera chart. The estimate of the combined savings and cost avoidance that you realize from your SAM program in the past year, it's in millions of dollars. So this was a huge, huge realization for me. I read this to say that your software asset management program, doing things well from a program view can save a million dollars from a third of the respondents, zero to a million dollars. I also look at the one to two million is 12%. So a little bit less than half are in the zero to two million dollar range. But look at that 7% that can save over $50 million. That is a big number for us to be able to save. Flexera has a big sample size. So 7% saving 50 million is a big number. Even 4% saving 25 to 50 million and another 5%, 10 to 25 million. If we think about those in a group, 16% of respondents saved at least $10 million. And that's from just software asset management. We could save through cloud and hardware as well. So having a great program can help us leverage and lock into some of that savings. When we think about a program, I think about us going out on this journey. We are walking through this journey, we do not have very much direction. We try to find our own way. And the next few slides will talk about us finding our slot or finding our direction and helping us find our way. But I like this picture because it's representative of many people who are going about their beginning of their asset management program and they're on this adventure. It's them and it's wide open spaces and trying to figure out context. And so it's very important for us to get off on the right track when we are establishing a program. We need to do the basics of the policies, the processes and the procedures in a very big picture way. And I say that because most of us do not consider how we get started and how do we go forward if we get off track? We will get off track. It is a certainty. But what do you do when you get off track? Do you leverage your resources or do you invest more money? How do you even measure whether you're off track and by how much? One of the illustrations I try to use frequently, but not overuse, is that for every degree that you are off track. And if you think about a degree, it's one 360th of a circle. So very small. But for every degree that you are off track, you will miss your intended destination by 92 plus feet for every mile you travel. So if you are off by just a few degrees and you desire to travel a long distance, you will miss your mark by a big, big margin unless you are always assessing and reassessing and how do we do things better from a program level view. In this getting off track and putting us back on track 
is all about program because we can do cloud well and still be off track. We can do software well and still be off track. Many software and hardware and asset management professionals and practitioners will tell you that, for example, if you do not have a strong hardware asset management program, you're probably going to struggle with software asset management because it's the software that lives on the hardware. And I, a few years ago, was asked by a very large consulting company, hey, can you help us find and set a process for our hardware asset management? They had 300,000 laptops, but only knew where 47% of them were. So that means, simple math, you have more than 150,000 laptops out there with all types of software licensing, software implications from that licensing, even the cost of renewals and cost of everything else, just because they did not do hardware asset management well. So we need to have a mechanism at the program level to help us understand what do we do when we get off track and how do we get back on track? And that leads me to this compass. We need a compass at the program level. We need something that tells us we are here. I think of the mall or an amusement park, you know, when you walk in and you're moving around and you're wondering, hey, where are we? And you see these huge maps and it has a little star and it says, you are here. We need to understand in our program where we are and which direction it is that we desire to go. Most organizations struggle with both aspects of this. And I would like you to think about how do you know where you are? And it's not from an assessment per se, Sure, assessments can help. And we at Service Management Leadership would love to help you with that. But you need some mechanism to help you understand where you are in what direction you want to go. The second part is something that is going to be unique to the organization. No outside organization is going to tell you where you need to go. And so you need to understand your direction and where you are headed internally and possibly with the help of a consultancy, but they're not the ones that are giving the answers. They're the ones that are asking the question. I like this picture of birds. I don't know if you noticed, but when birds fly, there's always a V pattern when they're in big groups, a flock, if you will. The leader is helping the birds that are behind them get to where they need to be more efficiently. The birds know how to go through the wind and the air as efficiently as possible, taking advantage of the aerodynamics that are created by the birds that are in front of them. And that's the same way that having a strong IT asset management program will help your cloud, your software, your hardware, but it also help your supply chain and your purchasing. It'll help your budgeting, your financial management. It'll also help in other ways. And so I think of this area where, how do we get people rowing in this right direction, in the same direction, at the same pace? How do we make sure that we are doing it in a way that everybody is on the same page and we communicate that? And so only with a strong program leadership will your asset management program deliver the optimal value for your stakeholders. And I wanna take this a step further. When I showed the picture of everybody rowing in the same direction, that means we have to have a program leader, like the person that sits in front of the boat saying, row, row, row in a methodical, in a consistent cadence. We need somebody that is accountable and is leading this effort from the 
viewpoint that everybody can see them and they can understand what good looks like. Many of us have been in situations where we did not have good program leadership with our asset management program or other programs. And it felt like we were doing things that were not cohesive. They were mismatched for activity on one person's part versus activities from another. And so we need to understand this value of the overall asset management program and how that person helps understand stakeholder desired outcomes, what are the needs, the risks, what are the capabilities that those stakeholders desire. And so I want you to be thinking of this. This is not a presentation that is going to give you all the answers. Nothing in 20 or 30 minutes will give you all the answers. But you have to be thinking, what is the problem statement? What is it that we're trying to solve? And I'm pushing out this thesis statement that what you're trying to solve is a program level view of your asset management environment, your tools, your people, your expertise, your vendors. You need some type of quality, and I mean high quality program level view. And of course, the last slide is my organization, service management leadership. And if your organization wants to improve its asset management capabilities, especially at the program level, we can help. I thank you for joining us during this as this has been a labor of love putting on this global ITAM summit. And I hope that you are enjoying it. Please give all of the speakers great feedback as they donated their time, their expertise to helping us all understand their areas better. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Let me know what you think of the summit as a whole. And thank you once again. I hope you enjoyed that presentation on a program level view of asset management. I welcome your feedback on what you might have learned, or maybe you think I missed something. I welcome that conversation. Now we'll have a word from our sponsor, Service Management Leadership, before we go to our next guest. Thank you once again for joining us, and hopefully you are finding great value from the Global ITAM Summit. Is your asset management program or CMDB sick? If your asset management program or CMDB is not healthy and you want to get either of them checked out, service management leadership will diagnose the issues. We will provide you with a free initial consultation and assessment. The short assessment includes a review of your metrics and tools. This includes what you are measuring and why, plus your tools and integration. A meeting with stakeholders to understand their needs. Most issues originate from unstated or unmet stakeholder expectations. We will ask the right questions. We will then summarize our findings at a high level and give you a proposal that discusses next steps. What makes service management leadership different than most consultancies you encounter is a holistic approach that comes from being in the industry for a few decades. Yes, decades. Our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller, began in the asset management industry in May of 1994. Our approach includes an end-to-end -end understanding of your processes. The holistic approach also includes an understanding of your current state tools and what you want to accomplish. The most important aspect of our holistic approach is the alignment of activities to the needs of stakeholders. Every action or effort that is not aligned to what your stakeholders need is wasted. Our approach also includes a review of your in-house expertise. Lastly, our approach includes an understanding of your current metrics and reporting and what is needed. 
If you are not getting the value needed from your asset management program or your CMDB, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller and our team of experts at Service Management Leadership. Next up, we have Pierce McDonald. He and License Hawk are IBM licensing experts. I thought Pierce might enjoy this t shirt software license management, maximizing overconsumption. And many organizations really struggle with that in the IBM licensing world. Please give it up to Pierce. Let him know your feedback and appreciation. And I thank him and the others for sharing their knowledge with us as they are experts in the field. Thank you for joining us. Pierce McDonald is going to share his IBM licensing expertise with us. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and um, been looking forward to this uh, presentation at ITAM Summit. Uh, today's topic is going to be around a framework for responding to an IBM license audit. And I guess the first thing is, uh, where did this framework come from? Well, this is a framework that we have developed within License Hulk. And uh, over, I guess, many, many lives, having helped clients over the years uh, defend audits, we've put up the framework. Now, this won't be overly detailed, but we will give you a structure as to how you might think about typically responding to an audit and the high level tasks that uh, are involved. Um, so the... Uh, Sorry. Uh, so the agenda is quite a simple one. Um, we'll first of all look and see what is an IBM license audit, why you're getting it. Uh, then we're also then going to have a look at what you can expect from IBM's perspective. And then we're going to actually get into the nitty gritties really of how you should be thinking about responding it uh, from a client perspective. So what is an IBM license audit? Well, uh, IBM would define this as IBM verifies that the following license terms, uh, that you are following the license terms and conditions. Um, you may, a license audit typically involves IBM assigning a third party, um, an auditor. Um, they call it a software license review, but the rest of us know it as an audit. Um, the auditor then will proceed to collect the data. Um, they will calculate and verify, and ultimately they will provide a compliance report. Now, this is just a, I suppose, a fact-based position that the audit presents. This then gets handed over to IBM where a commercial settlement isn't reached um, for any shortfalls. So uh, your organization, believe it or not, agreed to audits when they first uh, signed up to a license agreement as part of their um, um, main agreement. But also every time that you sign uh, for your SNS or any kind of an, uh, of an agreement, and that does not have to be a an actual signature, you're accepting any changes. So um, recently there was an update to the IPLA and just by virtue of renewing your support, you essentially clicked uh, the acceptance of the audit terms there. So you do get caught no matter how you work it. Um, why is it so significant? Well, it's significant first of all in terms of when, when, you, when an audit comes in, there's a lot of time and effort required to actually prepare for these things. You're going to have to collect the data, validate, verify. This is a significant disruption to your business. Um, but if that wasn't bad, the problem is very often the compliance gaps found, they're not small. They are can be hundreds of thousands, in some cases, many millions. And the last bit, of course, here is this one thing, having to go to all that effort, receiving the bill. This bill is very often unbudgeted expense. Your CFO will not be happy. And within the organization, it gets a very high profile and uh, and it ultimately is not a nice experience to be going through. So it's a significant impact to your business. So it should be taken very seriously. So when it comes to what you can expect, it's kind of two different perspectives, really. There is the one that IBM would share with you, and it would seem like a very simple process. And then there's the reality. Um, their official process really goes along. Um, you have a notification or the notification letter. Um, there is a kickoff and scoping call or series of calls. And then 
they will present you with a nice PowerPoint and a plan. And then the expectation is that you collect the data, send it back to them. They will collect it up, produce a report, and the project closes out. And if, again, if you were to take the uh, IBM's, uh, I guess, presentation out, this would take two to three months. The reality is very, very different. Um, I have never experienced uh, a license audit that got two or three months. In fact, they're very often err on the minimum of six months. And I've actually seen them going to 12 and 18 months, depending on how contentious the results were. Um, also, the steps that are described here really do simplify the process tremendously. There's a lot of details missing here. And that kind of leads us on really to the framework that we've developed to help. So when we respond to audits, we have a different approach. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you here. So we've got eight stages and uh, I'm going to do excuse me if I'm listing them off. And what you're going to find over the structure of this is we give one slide for each of the stages. And think of this as a framework. It's not meant to be exhaustive and there's a lot of detail under it, but it's a quite a good guideline. And if nothing else, it's a good checklist to see how well you've covered things off if you're preparing for an audit. So there's the initial uh, license audit response. And this is literally, what do you do when that letter arrives and the tasks that occur from there? There's an initial risk assessment, which is ultimately going to quickly identify how big is the problem and try and put some sort of a dollar value on the risk. In parallel, then you have the IBM license audit scope. And this very much emphasizes that uh, you can negotiate what's covered. And it's the first place where you really get to uh, push back on uh, the requests coming from IBM. You have an internal license audit. An internal license audit is really where you prepare all the information and try and get the best view before you send information over to the auditors. The next stage, then we look at optimization, remediation, and defense strategy. And this is really figuring out you know what your problems are, what can you do to manage them, and what are your strategies going to be about defending it. External audits where things get interesting. That's where you've declared the information, uh, you've shared it with the auditor, there will be a back and a forth over, well, IBM were quoting it, they'd say probably over a month or two, can be a bit much longer. And then once you've come to the end of that stage, the auditor will have done their job, there's a commercial settlement at IBM. That is really where you have to do the deal to pay for any shortfall in licensing. And finally, does the actual audit close project, the close the project. So let's get into the details, shall we? The initial audit response. The letter arrives. Once the initial, oh my God, fades away and you take a deep breath, what happens next? Well, we would say, if you have an audit, a uh, vendor audit protocol, initiate it. What is this, you might ask? Very, large, very often organizations are well used to getting audits from vendors. So they've established over time, maybe it's a checklist, maybe it's a very detailed process of how they handle audits. Find this out. This is the lessons learned from previous projects and can be invaluable in getting these moving. Verify the audit request. What exactly is, it, where does it come from? Uh, what is the detail of it? Have they identified, have they given you any clues as to the scope? Maybe it's the geographic, maybe it's the products and covered and so forth. Next step then is going to be informing the stakeholders. Um, this is going to be a wide audience of people within your organization. They would be potentially legal, procurement, SAM managers, uh, the technical teams. There'll be a variety of people that you will need to contact to let them know that an IBM audit is in process, to be ready for it, but also to manage their communication themselves. Next one is going to be around a single point of contact. This will be both within the organization and indeed in the communication with the auditor. This ensures that all the information is managed, the requests are managed properly, but also that information is reviewed and checked, and that it's no accidents occur, information is released that should not be. Then there's the simple process of initiating a project. As I mentioned, this is quite a significant impact on a business. Therefore, you need to put in place the formal structures of a project. There'll be a budget, there'll be a project manager, a full team. You may have to actually resource for third party support as well. So treat it as a project. You may need to engage some uh, consultants. When it comes to a license audit, I strongly advise you do because your in-house team will not have the experience that a third party team will. But this might be a once in a three year event for you. A license audit team, uh, the third party consultants will probably have done five this month already. And the last piece of this stage 
is con confirm the receipt and the conditional support of the auditor. Let them know you got the message and that you're working on it. Then we enter the next stage. Initial risk assessment. The goal really here is to try and quickly identify how bad is the situation. The main question that the senior manager is going to be posing to you is, once they hear there's an audit, they go, how bad is it? Do we have any idea how much this is going to cost us? And this particular piece in the project is what this is trying to achieve. It is not trying to get a perfect answer. It's trying to get a sense of the order of magnitude, how, how much information is available, how big this project is going to be, how bad might the number be right now? So steps involved here will be collecting the available entitlement information, what's available from a deployment perspective. The focus is very much on big fix and ILMT because this information is readily available. It is also what should be being recorded as part of your subcapacity licensing. And you'll prepare this initial risk assessment. Uh, but an important part of this here, and what initial risk assessment looks like, is a spreadsheet with products listed on one side, uh, quantities you have licenses for, quantities you've deployed, but also an estimate financially of what that risk might be. But also it's a chance here to quickly identify some quick fixes. There could be some very simple things that can be done, even at this moment in time, to reduce the problem. At Here's the end of this I one. I yes. have a question for you. So on this, can an organization then <clears throat> uninstall or address things before the IBM audit team comes in and <clears throat> does their thing? Is there a way to proactively mitigate some of the potential issues? It's a good question. Um, and it's something we touch on in one of the later stages. At the initial risk assessment here, really what you're looking for are some very obvious fixes. And what I'm talking about here can be things as simple as servers that have been decommissioned but haven't been removed from the database. Um, it could be just poorly maintained uh, ILMT that just simply needs the reports cleaned up and repaired. It can be just simple um, things like error messages appearing in the dashboard that would create doubt that could be very, very quickly remediated. None of this is interfering with deployment at this point here, or but it, some quick wins can be done here. Uh, a very simple example I've come across is a client where they hadn't bothered to exclude all of the, um, they, they were licensing all of the products as if they were production, yet they had many servers that were actually staging areas, DR, that simple correction alone dramatically reduced the compliance risks. So there's some quick fixes that can be done here. We will get back to that, uh, what I've called remediations and strategy in the next uh, slide or two. So we've got the initial risk assessment. We've got a rough idea how bad things are. It's time to now have a chat with the auditor. And what we're talking about here really is the letter that you will have received in from the auditor is generally fairly uh, broad. It will simply say, software license review for all products covered by um, IPLA or in your password advantage. But this can be negotiated. Um, first of all, you need to agree the NDA and um, that, that will take some negotiation. Why you need an NDA is that an audit is a special circumstance and any NDAs you have may not be strongly worded enough and will not protect the organization enough. So you need to make those more robust. And from a scope perspective, if the project, if you have a lot of products, particularly products that are not measured easily, uh, the auditor will actually be uh, quite open to negotiating. They will, have, of course, have to go back to IBM to verify this. But very often, they really just want to get a quick win. They want to get the project done as quickly as possible. And if you can propose suggested changes in scope, common ones, for example, might be you may exclude mainframe, you might exclude hardware appliances. These are common requests and the auditor will very often um, accept them. You may decide that if we focus on a different geographics, let's just focus on Europe or on certain data centers, maybe your primary data centers and maybe not the third party ones. These are all things that are open to negotiation, at the end of which then you'll hopefully have agreed the uh, scope of this particular audit. Now this is all happening in parallel, other things will be happening, which is the next phases. We will then at this point here, internally, we will do a license audit. And what I'm recommending very much here is you simulate the audit results before you hand them over to the auditor. This is collecting all of your entitlement, collecting all of your deployment, both for PVU and non-PVU products. 
checking things like, have we got all the information? Have we got all the servers we might need? Have we got all of the entitlement we might need? And then update and prepare a licensed position. And this has the advantage really of, first of all, giving you a sense of where the problems might be, but it also gives you a sense, you're now getting more and closer and closer to how serious the financial situation might be. And you also get a chance to, again, identify some quick wins to maybe reduce or eliminate risks. So internal audit is again, strongly advised that you get third-party support here. Get a consulting company who's done this, who might even have ex-auditors on their team to do this for you. But having this visibility before you hand it over is invaluable. Now reduce and remediate. And Jeff, this gets back to your question here, which was, can we change things? The auditor will say no. Um, and that's where we will differ because in any production environment, there is constant change. There's servers being commissioned, decommissioned. There's information being moved around. There is um, a constant ebb and flow of information. Also, very often there are compliance risks you know about that can be actually remediated and eliminated. Maybe mistakes were made that although the auditor might find them and correct them, they may not. And you want to present your cleanest, most correct license position possible. Simple things. It could be that you haven't, um, for example, uh, the DR licenses. They are free in the IBM world. Maybe you forgot to tick that off. Maybe there was past problems and errors in your ILMT that you now have discovered and you have tickets for. You want to be prepared that information. There may be other simple strategies to reduce the compliance position because you cannot rely on the auditor to calculate the most optimal license position for you. They just have to do calculations and present the results. It is up to you to correct those numbers and to make sure that the calculations are correct. So that's very much what you need to be doing here. The remediation may also be, part of this too, can be preparing. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> sorry, is um, once you understand your problem, what caused it? Have you got some way of maybe explaining that problem? You can see that there's a shortfall, but it could be that, oh, that cluster was only recently upgraded. Maybe there's a particular uh, license interpretation that you were not clear on. Maybe there's a, a, a very good reason for why it was done and why you have a defense. Again, as part of the reduce and remediation, it may not, you, may not be that you change the reports or change the calculations. It might be that you're preparing your arguments for why an, a, a, the calculation is the way it is. It's also worth noting at this point here that you'll focus on the high value uh, problems. There may be 50 things wrong, but very often two or three of them are where the majority of your risk is and with the ones for which you need to do the deep analysis and get to the bottom of what's causing it. And yeah, get, that's where you focus the efforts and save the money. And on that note, Pierce, I, you yes. mentioned something about optimal price, uh, optimal ELP and the way the auditor <laughs> would calculate it. I have never seen an auditor calculate it any other way than on behalf of the publisher. And so that is where the expertise from an external entity helps by making sure there's checks and balances on that calculation. That's just my experience. Oh, it's very, very true. And um, and I suppose you also got to keep in mind too that uh, like, a, like the doctors and the patients, auditors will differ. And one interpretation of the results can be interpreted very differently depending on the viewpoint. And within the organization, you may be able to explain what was actually meant by a certain license position. An auditor will take a very uh, black and white approach if the, the information, if the ILMT or if the snapshot report presents a piece of information, it will, they will evaluate it exactly as it is. But very often with a little bit of Q&A investigation, there might be a reason why. Or um, for example, the technical information might look like a production license tier three, but actually when you go and ask the administrators, they say, oh no, it's a tier one product and uh, it's non-production. The auditor does not have the opportunity to get that information unless you present it to them. So this is again, this preparation here, it helps you to fill out and provide the richest possible amount of information, accurate, um, on which to base the audit um, assessment later. So yeah, you need to help them to help you as well. 
Then we get to the good stuff, which is the external audit. Um, you'll have already established a project, um, and this is going to be a project you're going to be working with the with the auditor on. And they will have a plan. You will have a plan. I again always tell my clients, you're the one driving this, so you, they you need to be courteous and polite, of course, but they'll have requests. You handle them on your schedule because it's ultimately your business being disrupted. You'll agree things like the entitlement position, and that might take several iterations. You'll agree on the deployment, and this in, may take many uh, iterations because the first pass through, once you see the report, you might not agree with some of it. And with each pass through, it might take several before you reach a, uh, a consensus on what the actual deployment is. And then you get the auditor's report. And here's where things can also be interesting. This is not a fait complete in terms of you just take the report and there's no more about it. If you do not agree with it, you can again push back. You can uh, argue. And also you can actually insist that clarifications and notes are included in those reports before they're handed over to IBM. I would also say throughout this process here, you should allow no communication between the auditor and the, uh, in this case, IBM. Now that should be built into your NDA, but it should be emphasized continuously. There is no sharing of information um, throughout this process because very often at the beginning of, an ex of the external audit, the compliance com position can look very unpleasant. The numbers can be a huge gap, but with each pass through, with the more information you're providing and the more clarification you're providing, you can improve that number significantly. And you do not want an IBM account manager getting all excited about a huge payday at the beginning of a project when actually after a few passes through the process, that number dramatically reduces. So no sharing of the information with IBM. But there will come a point when you will have to and the auditor's report will be shared and then you enter into the commercial settlement. And this again is a negotiation. Um, it's where you negotiate and make, make reach a final agreement on the audit findings. And this might seem strange, but the auditor will present one set of numbers, which you can continue to argue the case and can continue to say, actually, no, I do not agree with this. I highlighted my concerns during the, uh, the audit process, but you can argue and negotiate. And again, you will get concessions. The commercial settlement, which you should also be aware here, this is ultimately IBM wishing to do a deal. They are not concerned about compliance at this point. And it is not unusual, first of all, for a deal to be done at a significantly lower figure than the auditor's number. Also, you can buy a variety of different products that not, are not actually products that are out of commercial, uh, that are out of um, compliance with the with the with IBM. They ultimately wish to do a deal. And they will also, it might be an opportunity for you to include other things. You might decide we're settling the audit here. Do you know what? Let's buy some other products. This is a commercial agreement here, and you can make many problems go away by just doing the right size deal. So continue, keep in mind, this is a commercial negotiation. It is no longer about compliance or IP. And then we reach a formal close. The last step here in the audit is, an audit, is a license audit close. And this is very much, uh, it does get neglected actually very often when you're just done the deal, you just want to forget about the project and hopefully not to deal with that for another three years. But I do strongly advise that you record the lessons learned. Archive all your material and your evidence because it may be, a, it could be a very good starting point for your next audit because unfortunately mistakes repeat. Uh, you will want to make sure you get formal notice of closure from, from IBM. So the door is closed on those past compliance problems. Um, you'll want to go through the project yourself and actually ask yourself, how did this well? How do we react to this? Can we improve our, uh, our audit responses for future audits? And ultimately record and learn those lessons. So the audit close is again an important step. So hopefully what I've presented here to you is a useful framework. As I said, many of these tasks we looked at here blow out into significant pieces of work, sometimes a day, sometimes many months. But the framework can give you an idea to check your through and ultimately uh, help you hopefully to get a better resolution in uh, your IBM license audits. So with that, um, Jeffrey, do you have any questions on behalf of our audience? I have one, and that is how, when you go through that settlement stage, 
how IBM or any other publisher sees it as a sales opportunity where you may see it as an opportunity to save money and just how that should be viewed by all parties because IBM does see that as a sales opportunity, I think. Oh, it's very much a sales opportunity. Uh, there's a reason why the compliance function reports into finance and not uh, uh, compliance within the IBM structure. Um, it's a sales opportunity, but it's also, you. It's very often the compliance gaps, they're legitimate. You've overdeployed and you, you just were poorly managing. But it's also a chance here for you to kind of open and, I guess, broaden the conversation and say, OK, we're short on licenses here, here and here. How can we make this a win-win for all of us? How can we maybe, for example, decide, well, there was a new policy we were thinking about. Maybe we can look at that. Um, maybe we can cover off the licenses here and make this a better deal. Uh, it could also be very often there are different ways to close compliance gap. You can buy different products. You might have a shortfall in MQ, but it turns out if you buy some cloud pack, that has got built into it MQ entitlement. Or uh, similarly, there might be a product that you're sunsetting and you go, that compliance gap is historical or it was accidental. Can we cover that off? But actually we will buy something else that um, that will make it better for everyone or the future we're moving towards. And again, IBM are practical here. Ultimately, they just want a big deal. And the, what makes up the inside of that deal is open to negotiations. Yes, and that's, that's a great way for us to end it. Pierce, I do thank you for sharing your expertise on IBM licensing and uh, you are a wealth of information in this area. Thank you. I probably should have put my closing slide as well. So in case anyone needs to contact me, um, you'll probably find my face on LinkedIn. Uh, info at licensehope.com uh, for any questions or queries. There's a phone number if you really want to WhatsApp me or uh, message me. And uh, this has been a pleasure, Jeffrey. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pierce. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Pierce, for sharing your expertise with us. Now a word from our sponsor, Service Management Leader. Service management is complex. Each organization will have its own unique complexities. Solving these complexities is hard, very hard, because these turbulent times have caused changing organizational priorities. The increased dependence on partners has only increased complexities. Every organization has a shortage of in-house expertise. The technologies, integrations, and reliance on data has increased the complexities exponentially. Now we are asked to incorporate emerging technologies into our already complex environment. Solving these complexities is the only way to deliver value in today's service management world. Fact. Most leaders are unhappy, very unhappy, with the value derived from their service management programs. Value is elusive but it must come from getting the most out of your people, processes, and technology. And all three must work together. Every leader must ask themselves this one question. Are you getting enough value from your service management investments? IT service management solves business problems, not technical problems, as said frequently by our founder, Jeffrey Tiefertiller. To solve the complexities and deliver optimal value, we must focus on the business problems that need to be solved and align our activities accordingly. Jeffrey and service management leadership have solved this for many companies and organizations and can do so for you. They are experts in getting the most from service management investments. If you are not getting the desired value from your service management investment, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller at Service Management Leadership today.
Help is on the way. Next up, Alexander Golev with Sam Expert. Alexander is the authority on Microsoft licensing and is willing to share his knowledge and expertise on LinkedIn and YouTube. Thought he might appreciate this shirt. Asset manager, unique skill set of cat herder and detective. Make sure you show your appreciation for Alexander. I thank him for sharing his opportunity expertise and his knowledge with us. Hello, friends, and welcome. I'd like to talk about the software and cloud costs that may be bleeding your budget dry. And they are. It's hardly breaking news. The costs have been climbing year on year, and it will never stop. And I suspect in your organization, as in every mature organization, there are procurement heroes to deal with this. The problem of 2024, however, is that negotiations got tougher. The stakes got higher. The discounts got slimmer. With the cloud, what started with a simple lift and shift turned into end-to-end -end data center migration and developing new line of business bloodline applications. Applications not only natively developed for the cloud, but also tightly integrated into specific cloud features and environments. And as a result, procurement is finding itself at the forefront of a new era of negotiations. The era that requires cutting-edge knowledge that needs to be data-driven that needs a completely new set of tools and improved old school negotiation skills taken to a completely new level. And this didn't happen overnight. The trend began in about 2021 when major software vendors realized that they have enough power and more confidence, some of them offering little or no valuable alternative for their software and services. And they decided to weaponize it further. On the other hand, we need to recognize that we have this interesting and even sad situation when procurement and supporting experts got used to relying in the last years on pure negotiation, overlooking the value of thorough preparation and data-driven, data-driven leverage. I wouldn't probably go as far as to say we have become complacent, but you get the idea. And add to that, that the introduction of new technologies for example, like Copilot or Teams, the negotiation experts may be entering into talks with vendors like Microsoft, lacking the required technical knowledge and lacking the up-to-date, top-notch negotiation skills. There is a skill gap between the vendor and the customer. It's not entirely new. We saw something like it 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago, with the introduction of services like Office 365 and software as a services in general. What I want to do today is to stay away from discussing extremes like the recent acquisition of VMware by Broadcom. Let's just talk about one vendor that our team at some expert knows best. The vendor that has such a strong offering and presence and integration of everyday operations, both in the cloud and the premises. So they almost have become almost like a water or electricity. It's Microsoft. Negotiation with Microsoft now in 2024 is entirely different from what it was in 2014 and even in 2020. Microsoft continuously improves its sales tactics. It continuously trains its sales teams. There are now so many battle-proven tools in that tool belt. Stage discounts. Simultaneous negotiating at multiple levels in your organization. Much improved and more mature value presentation and more. Since you are probably in the cloud, Azure, or somehow connected to it with technologies like Azure Stack, Microsoft negotiation plans are often data-driven. It's your data that drives the negotiation. They may even know more than you do about what's going on with your consumption of their products and services. And they also continuously improve its position with introducing new cutting-edge products. And the best example right now is Copilot for Microsoft 365 which many experts, including us, call the new Excel. And there are consequences. One of them is Microsoft positions more and more products at fixed price. M365 Copilot is an excellent example. Such approach is highly unusual to Microsoft. If you know how enterprise agreement works, for example, 
There are predefined programmatic discounts depending on the size of your organization. It just does not apply to Copilot. And although negotiating a discount on Copilot is not impossible, we've done a few. Please don't overstretch your expectations. Unless your organization is humongous and influential, you'll probably end up with a single digit. You'll be lucky if you get two digits on the discount. And even on traditional products and services offered via traditional ways, negotiated discounts are still decreasing. Of course, your particular situation will depend on multiple factors like your organization size, your marketing initiatives together with Microsoft, your industry, the quality of your team, your preparedness. But everyone is seeing a palpable decrease. If, for example, your regular discount was 20 to 25% previously, consider yourself negotiation superheroes if you manage to achieve the same figures this year. Plus, most of the time, what will Microsoft do is this will be your initial discount, which will then decrease year on year. So when you approach your next renewal, you will be in a weaker position and Microsoft will be in a stronger one. So I guess by now I painted a very dim picture, but what is the lesson? And the lesson here is simple. You can no longer approach a negotiation or prepared. You can't anymore just wing it solely based on your charisma, connection, and even your multi-year experience of agreement renewals. So how do you prepare? Let me give you some practical advice. Point number one that I personally strongly believe in is that the optimization has returned. In recent years, and I'm talking about almost 10 years, many large organizations, especially really large enterprises, have lost their focus on optimization because negotiation was easy. When discounts flowed freely, it was easy to just negotiate. Often, though, I must give it to them, relying on tactical preparation and looking ahead. But with decreasing discounts and more aggressive negotiations recently, it's entirely up to you to decide whether you can continue ignoring the data-driven optimization and preparation, or it's maybe time to bring it back if you want to squeeze every, every opportunity. And there are at least two reasons to resurrect optimization pre-negotiation. The first one is it's a chance to clean up your house. Unless you have a fantastic software asset management and FinOps team, there are always unused products. There are always unused technologies, unused cloud resources. As a result, there are also compliance discrepancies. In the organizations where software asset management and FinOps are not mature, a thorough, truly data-driven optimization can uncover 40 to 50% of the next term's potential savings or more. And the second reason is, is this is an opportunity to learn about your estate. Forgive me for repeating the banality, but knowledge is power. And this is especially true in negotiations. Microsoft will come prepared. Their team will have enough data to closely monitor signals from your side and telltale signs about your knowledge of your own estate. But even if you decide to ignore the optimization stage, a thorough strategic planning is vital. And I'm talking firstly now about the technology planning. Answer the questions. What technologies do you want to deploy? What Microsoft 365 packages will you need and why? What are your personas? What are the alternatives? The alternatives to, say, Microsoft 5. And even that is not the most important part. The true key to success, the true key to success is to be properly professionally prepared for the negotiation itself. You need a plan, a plan that includes your most desirable outcome. What is your ideal picture? Where do you want to be? What discounts you want to get? What products you want to get? When? How? On what terms? In addition to that, your least desirable outcome. What if negotiation doesn't go your way? Badna, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Here, we're not talking about you going away from an enterprise agreement. But for example, if you're negotiating a discount on Microsoft 36555, the biggest all-inclusive, not truly, but all-inclusive package. Your partner may be staying on Microsoft 36553 and taking alternative security products. Your plan must establish very clear roles and responsibilities for negotiation. When you build a team, roles and responsibilities must be very clearly assigned to each team member and also to each involved stakeholder level, each involved seniority level. We also advise to engage your legal department from the very start. We're not saying bring them into the negotiation room. That is usually not the best advice, but they must be prepared. They must understand what you're talking about, what the agreements are about, because you may need them later. 
you might. And I'll repeat myself, prepare your stakeholders, especially senior ones, especially at the board level. All the escalation points up to the board level. Get everybody on the same page. Get them agree with the plan. Nobody can afford an uninformed decision maker at the top level undermining the effort of the entire negotiation team. And that happens. And last but not least, your plan needs to be agile. You need to have room for maneuver. You need to be ready, whatever happens. So with all this in mind, this stages deliverable must be a detailed negotiation plan, a detailed negotiation playbook. I would even put it this way, a playbook that captures every detail and establish the process, the framework and the deliverables. And when I talk about details, you should include stuff like communication protocols, vendor interaction strategies, even tactics, and an explicit escalation process, both on your side and on the Microsoft side. The plan should also include readiness for modern day tactics in Microsoft negotiations. So let's discuss a few, starting from you should expect from Microsoft. And the top three are as follows, sweet discounts. Instead of discussing specific individual product discounts like Copilot, what Microsoft may fall back to is having conversations about the discount on the entire Microsoft 365 suite. What it does is it takes away from focusing on particular products and takes it to a higher level, which is a little bit harder to discuss. And as a result, you may not achieve what you wanted to achieve. Yes, this may make the entire suite more appealing, but it takes away the focus and may not be what you wanted to do in the beginning. The second tactic is, we call them declining discounts. You can call them stage discounts, decreasing discounts. Microsoft offers discounts that decrease year on year. And what this does, it ticks two boxes. It gives you a very quick satisfaction because the discount of the first year could be even higher than you asked for. But by the end of your agreement's term, the discount decreases to the point that provides Microsoft with a much better starting position in the next term, in the next negotiation. It's quite challenging to then start a new discussion from asking for more again. So Microsoft's starting point in three years from now is better and yours is weaker. And the point number three is the page from an age old sales book, linking quantity to tiered pricing. It's always worth reminding of the importance of balancing the lure of a better discount if you commit to a bigger volume with the actual needs. And this tactic also ticks at least two boxes. Firstly, most clients psychologically tend to commit to more when the discount is attractive enough. And the second is a hidden trap because as a result of over committing, you may actually start consuming that quantity. And then you'll approach your next renewal with potentially dead weight of services and software you don't require. Our professional tip here is exercise restraint. It's always better to undercommit, even if a discount looks very promising. So that's about Microsoft's tactics, but what you can do, what you may consider, and let me give you a few points here as well. Firstly, Obviously, recognize the influence of your organization's size. And not only size, let's also talk about the brand. The size and the brand play a crucial role in negotiations. The bigger you are, the larger your organization is, the more famous is the brand of your organization, the better leverage you have in negotiations. It seems simple, but we sometimes witness even influential, influential companies being afraid to negotiate aggressively with Microsoft, being intimidated by them. If you are large, you have greater bargaining power, leverage it. And going back to the brand, this works really well with the next point. Microsoft may be willing to provide you additional discounts for marketing initiatives. If you agree to provide them public relation opportunities, them referring to your name, using your organization as an example case, even regardless of your size, if you're open to it, ask for a discount. And the more influential your brand is, the better discount you may ask for. Our tip number three is don't forget that you negotiate with people. Yes, you negotiate with Microsoft, but you negotiate with people. So utilize the motivation of your Microsoft account manager. It's crucial to recognize that your Microsoft account executives have specific targets, strong incentives to offer new and exciting cloud products and software. Copilot is a good example. It affects their performance. It affects their own personal position in life and in Microsoft itself. How do you know what drives them? 
you can either do a recon, you can ask professional negotiators, or you can have an unofficial open conversation with your Microsoft account executive. And the last but not least, especially for new products, you can negotiate partner incentives, so-called partner incentives, where Microsoft pays to a Microsoft partner to help you implement a certain product. This is not a discount on the agreement, but it may help you not only reduce costs of the implementation itself, but also just do it better with a partner that knows how to implement that certain product. Suppose you have this plan. Suppose you did everything, what we just discussed, ticked all these boxes, your negotiation starts. The first point that I want to emphasize again is be ready to adapt. Whatever happens, be agile, be flexible. In our experience, you need agility. You must be able to adapt to changing circumstances and moving goalposts. Some challenges requiring you to adapt may come from unexpected places, including your internal stakeholders. The other point is, I'm unsure I need to remind you, but refrain from spontaneous decisions. If there's a new offer or input, especially during a, an on-site face-to-face negotiation, always take your time. Never come back with an answer immediately. Do the homework, thinking, brainstorming, consulting with your team in the comfort of your own environment. By the way, this is a famous technique of Japanese negotiation teams, and we find that it works regardless of your culture. Internal collaboration. Internal collaboration is the bloodline of every negotiation. Microsoft will try to negotiate on every level, on every seniority level, starting from your technical context, the people with whom the technical account managers talk, and going up to your chairman. Every such contact, especially here, must be under very strict control and visibility. Establish the necessary lines of communication, monitor and react accordingly. Everything what we've just discussed, communication, not taking spontaneous decisions, every level must play exactly by the same rules. Be careful, however, not to overcomplicate it. Keep it simple, especially in highly politicized organizations. Overdoing and overcomplicating the internal reporting process drains the energy from the team and from the process and risks undermining it. With all these checks and balances in place, only when you have all these checks and balances in place, don't shy away from informal conversations with Microsoft. Informal conversations add a valuable dimension to the entire negotiation process, as long as you don't leak out vital information. The bottom line is that to continue achieving stellar negotiation outcomes, we must constantly evolve. The days of Casual negotiations are over. The question is, are you ready to step up your game or are you prepared to start paying more for less? That's the choice. I hope you learned something valuable and thanks very much again for being here. Thank you, Alexander, for helping us understand the world of Microsoft better, especially making data-driven decisions. Microsoft is an area of licensing that many organizations struggle with. So we thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Also make sure you check out Alexander's YouTube channel as he puts out great content as maybe you want to learn more about Microsoft licensing. Now a word from our sponsor, Service Management Leader. Is your asset management program or CMDB sick? If your asset management program or CMDB is not healthy and you want to get either of them checked out, service management leadership will diagnose the issues. We will provide you with a free initial consultation and assessment. The short assessment includes a review of your metrics and tools. This includes what you are measuring and why, plus your tools and integration. A meeting with stakeholders to understand their needs. Most issues originate from unstated or unmet stakeholder expectations. We will ask the right questions. We will then summarize our findings at a high level and give you a proposal that discusses next steps. What makes service management leadership different than most consultancies you encounter is a holistic approach that comes from being in the industry for a few decades. Yes, 
decades. Our founder, Jeffrey T. Fertiller, began in the asset management industry in May of 1994. Our approach includes an end-to-end -end understanding of your processes. The holistic approach also includes an understanding of your current state tools and what you want to accomplish. The most important aspect of our holistic approach is the alignment of activities to the needs of stakeholders. Every action or effort that is not aligned to what your stakeholders need is wasted. Our approach also includes a review of your in-house expertise. Lastly, our approach includes an understanding of your current metrics and reporting and what is needed. If you are not getting the value needed from your asset management program or your CMDB, contact Jeffrey Tiefertiller and our team of experts at Service Management Leadership. This concludes our fourth annual Global ITAM Summit. I wanted to thank each of our guests for sharing their expertise with us and thank you, the audience, for hanging in there with us through all of these sessions as they are tremendous in being able to show value in the world that we live in, asset management. Please show your appreciation and support our experts in their specific fields and reach out to them if you have questions. They are great people and they would look forward to hearing from you. Hope you have an awesome rest of your day.